that we get started Hi, how are you? So everybody, if you want to come in, grab a chair, get cozy, get to know your neighbor, make some friends, that'd be great. All right, so... I'm going to call the meeting to order. Oh, people want to kind of crowd in. I know there's people still out there. All right, so I'm going to call the meeting to order. Before we do roll call, I'd like to swear in our new directors. And, oh, well, I guess I'd be swearing in myself. <laughs> or Julie's going to swear us in. So, um, me? <laughs> Mr. Leopold and um, Dave Vaughn. Yeah. And oh, and Dan, but Dan's not here right now. So, um, so I guess the three of us, if we can maybe stand somewhere and let's do up here in the front, maybe. I haven't met Dave Vaughn yet. students came through and um, worked with the university to get a student representative, which we're very excited to have. We always love having student input, so thank you and welcome. I wanted to briefly just maybe read a, a, a quick letter. Um, Can I do roll call? Oh, okay. Before any announcements? Okay. Roll call. Let's do roll call first. <laughs> <laughs> Director Baltor. Here. Director Chase. Here. Director Dutra. Here. Director Hagen. Here. Director Leopold. Here. Director Lynn. Here. Director Matthews? Here. Dr. McPherson? Here. Dr. Rios? Dr. Rothwell? Dr. Rotkin? Here. Ex officio Director Thomas? Present. Ex officio Director McKee? Serving Great, thank you. Report. So um, I just want to read a quick letter that uh, the students that worked on this um, sent me this morning. They just asked me if I would read this to you guys. Um, Dear Chair Dutra and the Santa Cruz Metro Board of Directors, we wanted to thank you for supporting our efforts to make UCSC's ex officio seat on the Santa Cruz Board Metro of Directors a student position. While we were unable to make it this morning's meeting to this morning's meeting due to academic conflicts, we wanted to wish Devon the best in his position and say that we are looking forward to a future where students are more closely integrated with the governance of the Santa Cruz Metro. We believe this new partnership between the board and UCSC students is a great step forward for both organizations, and we are excited to work together to ensure that Metro remains a convenient and accessible option for everyone. 
Going forward, we suggest the board continue to seek out opportunities for student engagement and involvement. We are very excited to see that the board and students can accomplish together. Sincerely, Alice Momberg, Vice President of Internal Affairs at UCSC Student Union Assembly, and Noah Thorin, Representative of UCSC Advisory Committee on Campus Transportation and Parking. So that was them, and welcome aboard. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Um, are the, so announcements, this, before we begin our meeting, Carlos would like to step up here and um, he's our interpreter and maybe say it and welcome you, introduce yourself and, in and you can do that in Espanol también. Good morning, buenos días, directors, Carlos Valdaverde, your interpreter. Para las personas que prefieren español, voy a estar en la parte de atrás. Thank you. Gracias. Gracias. Okay, and this meeting is being televised by the Community Television of Santa Cruz County, Channel 26. Our technician today is Ms. Mr. Lynn Dunton. Thank you for coming and doing this. Okay, dope. So, announcements. Are there any announcements from the board members that are not on the agenda that you would like to, to say? Yes? I would just like to thank our administration for yesterday's visit with Mr. Canada. Brought back with me personally over the years that Leon Panetta used to come to our high school <coughs> hearing students. And when he said, as Leon did, and his son Jim did yesterday, participation in our government is the one thing that we all owe our society. And that goes, extends really to young men like Davon and others who do participate, and I thank all of you who are here in attendance, thank you. Thank you. Um, and I, I don't know if it's on our agenda, but is Panetta, is it on here at all or no? I was just going to cover it under CEO comments. Okay. So I'm just going to make an announcement. We did have um, three of us, Mr. Leopold and Norm and myself, we met with Cong Congressman Panetta yesterday. He came to tour our, our facility, and we thank him very much for coming and listening to us and, and hearing our needs. Um, as many of you have heard over the past, past years, we have a lot of needs. We have a lot of buses that need to replace. We have to replace over 60 in our fleet. Um, we have you know, fires on our buses, and we need to definitely start upgrading them. So, And they cost money, and having a good person in, in D.C. to help us you know, get some grants um, is, is important and to keep that relationship for other um, costs as well. So thank you, for Mr. Panetta, for coming to visit us. Yes, Mr. Rockin. I'm sure most people don't realize how expensive the bus is, not just some money. Each bus costs between a half a million and a million dollars. And to think about the cost of that, and the federal government has historically paid about 80% of that cost in grants to uh, districts. You have to come up with matching money, which is one of the reasons we, you know, we have trouble. We, we can't go out tomorrow and get them all, even if the federal government gave us that money. But there's been problems getting that money. It's, it's really important to connect with our Congress member about this issue. Right. Thank you. 100%. They are expensive. You're driving a million dollar vehicles when you're on them. Jimmy? Yes. I, I might just suggest you send a letter to the editor or someone and just take the occasion. Okay. Thank Jimmy for his visit and reiterate the need. Great. Yeah. That, thank you. So, Okay, we got that. So, Jimmy, I'll just say one other yes, thing. Do we each have a letter from Congresswoman Anna Eshoo, who uh, represents the northern part of uh, Santa Cruz County, about her her efforts? I want to assure everyone that uh, Anna Eshoo, uh, Congresswoman from San Mateo, who represents the northern part of the county, has also been a very good friend of ours in this effort as well. As has uh, Senator Diane Feinstein. We have a big, big. We haven't. Uh, well, Kamala Harris hasn't been in office enough, but we go on our annual visit to Washington, D.C. It's been uh, highly successful, comparatively. Uh, one time we got three electrical buses, which was unheard of for a small district like ours a couple years ago. Uh, we'll keep that effort up, but we have a great team back in the uh, in, uh, U.S. House of Representatives as well as U.S. Uh, Senate. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, item number five. So we're going on to an exciting por portion of our day. We had an art contest. As you can see when you walked in this morning, we have art from students in different schools in the county um, up along the wall. And we are excited that um, we have this participation from our youth. And it's always nice to see when you, see, when you can see art because you know a lot of times it's the first thing cut in programs. So it's nice to see that we can um, have students you know, participate, especially in Metro. 
So, um, let's start giving out the awards. Maybe, um, would you mind handing them out? Sure. That'd be great. I'll read the names and um, our vice chair will be handing it out, Mr. McPherson. So, let's start with the drawing posted at Pacific Station and Inside Buses. So these are the drawings that are posted in the, inside the Pacific Station and Inside Buses. And I'm hoping that these names are in order as their places. So first place goes to Gabriella Italia. Is that correct? No. Not first place? Okay, not first place. Okay. So these are just the drawings. I'm sorry. I get it. So, um, the next drawing inside the station is Jonathan Vasquez. No, this is um, these aren't in, these aren't in play. I guess the these are just drawings. I think I lean. Okay. You want me to do this? Yes. Please. Okay. <laughs> Yes. Well, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So my name is Eileen Wagley. I'm the, actually the Para Cruise Eligibility Coordinator, but I assisted in organizing this art contest. It's an annual event for the Metro. And we put out a poster contest, and the winners um, have their artwork posted inside the buses. It kicks off at the county fair during the uh, school day, and then everyone turns in their, um, their entries. And we had all of our staff actually judge, and we selected the first prize is awarded the cover of the headways, and that is Ryu. I hope I said that correctly. Ryu. Ryu. Ryu was our headway. Very fabulous modern drawing. And he. Look at that. The second place winners had their um, had their drawings posted on the inside of the buses as well as on the outside placard boards that are affixed to the exterior of our buses. We put those on, I think, eight or nine. Uh, we have, I think, 90 or so buses. So you'll see those driving on various routes. And that is, second place is a nice. She's here. Is that how we say that? So a nice, wonderful drawing, drawing is there. And who else is the second? Olivia. Olivia is also second place. And she was the uh, third place winner last year, too, so she's a repeat winner. Right. Very nice. Thank you. Third place, we have uh, Jaden. And she has the left the bus be with you. And you can see the third place over on the left side of the road there. Jaden. And Sienna. And I don't know if Isabella is here. She also had third place. She's here. Oh, wow. She had a colorful yellow box there. It's the smaller drawing. And Elliot, is Elliot here? And I don't know. I mean, did, did, did you say Ricky? There are two. Second year entrant, too. I'm sorry. He's a second year entrant. Oh, right, right, right. The set, he's a repeat, uh, a repeat artist here. He's checking out his bag. <laughs> <laughs> and we had three honorable mentions. Uh, Malachi. I don't know if Malachi is here. Oh, do we have anyone else left? Yes. You should have. Jonathan? Yeah. Jonathan. I have your bag. 
hang on, I'll, I have, no, this is, this is, who's got? <laughs> Malachi, okay, so I do have your bag. And Jonathan, and then is Gabriella here? Okay, so let me get yours. And that, and did you say Ricky? Ricky was, Ricky third was placement. third place, he's already, oh, he's already, no, he hasn't been, okay. he's here. Is that I don't think he's okay, okay, so, I missed Ricky, I'm sorry. Ricky is third place. Why don't we get all the kids to come up in front of their pictures and take a quick picture? You guys come, the kids come up here and stand in front of your paintings, and then maybe we can have staff take a picture of all this. No, that's what I meant, stand together in the front. Yeah, not in front of your painting, but just stand in the middle. I guess I will. <laughs> okay, while we're getting them all squared away, we also would like to thank the sponsors for the uh, contest. They provided uh, cash and also some prizes, the Boardwalk Bowl, Round Table Pizza in Watsonville, Kelly's Books in Watsonville, Pizza, Ebenezer Ice Cream, Forever Fly, which provided the uh, first prize uh, skateboard bit. deck is the bit. winning prize. You that is a new skateboard Ready, shop smile. in Watsonville. One, two, three. <laughs> Play Great Against picture. Sports I'll make sure that in SoCal. And a special thank you to Palace Arts, who provided a gift certificate also. And hopefully you'll all continue in your art. Endeavors. So thank you for coming, and you can you can get to all of these destinations using public transit. The 71, the 69, the 72 will all take you uh, to Watsonville. The Live Oak buses, the 66, the 68, and uh, the Downtown Metro Transit Center, as well as the Watsonville Transit Center, will get you close to all of these businesses so you don't have to park and you can uh, support the environment and our local vendors, too. So thank you very much for participating this year. You guys can come around and get a better picture. Feel free as a parent. Come around. All right, kids smile for your parents. <laughs> Good job. Congratulations, all you guys and gals. Awesome. <laughs> I'd also like to add they have a bus downstairs that we can take photo ops and you guys can go inside the bus and see your art. Yay! And you can right. see it on the side of the bus. So you guys get to go get into a bus and see your art. Awesome. All right, guys, thank you so much. Off to school. Yeah. Sorry to ruin your morning. Back to school, everyone. <laughs> Yeah, thank, thank you to all the parents, you know, without you guys, you know, we, the kids, you need direct, they need direction, so thank you so much, appreciate it. Parents are great. There's a packet under each easel for the kids to take with them of all the art, and they are also welcome to take their, um, their art home Okay, so you guys, you can grab your art, everybody, so. And the packets that are underneath as well as your, are yours as well. So all the all the paintings that are anything as well. Okay, you can take it. Yes. <laughs> Parents, don't forget the packets as well. They're yours as well on the ground. So you may take all of the extra copies of your drawings. We thought you might want those to give to family and friends, Disaster. or you could draw on the back of them for next year. Very frustrating. <laughs>
Thank you. 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 Thank Awesome. Oh, glow stick, huh? That's pretty exciting. They'll be able to see you at night. <laughs> yeah. And then I can get some pizza as well. Pizza? Yeah. I got a lot of gift cards. I need some pizza. Yeah. Well, I would pay to enter this. Why don't I get to win something like this? Or, yeah, definitely. Well, good luck. You go have fun on the bus downstairs and do good, do well in school. Only when I speak. Yes. No, I have one, but thank you. Okay. Yeah. Bye, guys. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. Okay. You're welcome. All right. Thank you. Oops, thank you. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, at this time, we'll do board of directors comments, and there are probably none. I, no comments. Okay. Communications to the board of directors. So this is going to be from the uh, public. If there's anything not on the agenda that you guys would like to say, speak now or forever hold your peace. Okay, thank you. This is looking good so far. Oh. Oh, yes. Okay. I'm going to hand out her. Okay. So, morning. I am the committee. My name is Ophelia Gomez. I am the committee for the senior and disabled in one community in Emily Lagoon. I will present in the last few months and we'll have a year of that. Some projects and they make the answers in December 22nd. So I always still say a few things for the table and for the community. As the studio, I wish we can be here because my walker press don't fit in any car. I bring my case. I put him down, I, I saw the guy, I don't make it any suggest. So we ask him again for the early bus is 71, one bus every day from $40 from Cabrillo College. I don't know what I do between Cabrillo College and here in metro, in the metro in the budget. One early bus at 6 30 at least at 6 45. One early bus every day for the senior, disabled, family, children, everybody. So we ask him also a few things every in Santa Cruz County, a few projects. And they say yes, uh, the same wall and some friends and some of those friends also is uh, Capitol Amor, Holy Fears, que is uh, the city council of the Capitol Amor. The same thing in Watsonville. I think they're doing the construction right now in Main Street and Pennsylvania, the sidewalk for the Princess Market. I think they're doing the, the sidewalk for the steel one cream. So the other thing that we're asking is for recognition for our... Excuse you me? To... We want a recognition as disabled for the los walkers because they don't fit in any car. It doesn't my friends, my family. It don't fit. So I don't bring my walker to the side falling down. My excuse is not my need. But as a studio and disabled, we thinking that we all go over there. So if you don't have a paracruise, you don't have a, a, any way of transportation, the only way is the bus. So we're asking for a, be recognized the, the, the walker, be more sensible, say for more cooperation between everybody, and not with the mood the bus driver, we have to say for the bus driver cooperation too. Sometimes they are really nice. So we want uh, Getting the early buses for the 71, but we want some real, we want some more, a different district. We have a different district representation here. They know me sometimes, so I don't want to be annoying. I don't want to be the angry lady. Just we want to be representing. I don't want to be political, believe me. I don't want one million dollars. We want to be not falling down, we'll be safe, we'll be safe in our street in different places. So now can we have it for four years more than new people, the university. Or oh, one asking, what is it we can go for the new three electrical buses that the senior can be over there? Just not only for the for the university. Or oh, if we have it, the money for this 91, 71, early 91 buses too. So in Santa Cruz, we don't have it, we have it once on big. So we wanted the same thing, the same issue for Santa Cruz. We want early buses for Santa Cruz, there's only one bus early, so we're not asking too many. So we want more support for senior disabled 
It doesn't matter right now the political. We want to be honest as a person, a human being. We have rights and know I'll be safe and not be miserable. Thank you so much. Thank you. Have a wonderful day. I don't want to be right now with my voice here because it's not fit. Thank you. I so, no, thank I understand. You. I think we may have some answers on a couple of your things. Yeah, no, for the answer it was so tedious. So I can get one more second. It was so tedious because I can't wait for the Caltrans okay, or the same okay, I'll go to the Caltrans. No, no, but I think you, some of your points you were asking today, I think we do have some some point, we have some clarification on this. But it's not clear. clear. The it's not, it's I, let the, let's just let the staff speak real quick and then. Not so much answers, but let me just tell you what we have done since we received the initial communication. I believe it was in Capitola. Um, we've looked at all of the items on that list. Now, first and foremost, I don't know if these are new items or those uh, repeated those other items. We'll have to evaluate the letter we received today. But what we've done is uh, we've broken those down into sort of three different categories. There were a, a number of issues that were presented that are city related. They're not they're not metro related. Those have been captured, and then a letter has been sent out to each of the cities involved to let them know what the observations were about particular city issues. Um, where there were uh, um, stop issues, we have those, and we're evaluating those uh, for potential future upgrades if they if they warrant those. Uh, and then where there were service-related uh, concerns, um, we, we've evaluated those, and some of those may go on what we call the unmet needs list. And, and if somewhere down the road we have money to put new service in, the board would look at all of the unmet needs and sort of try to decide on a priority basis where best to place those dollars. Um, so those are the categories we've broken it down to, and a letter has been sent um, uh, to uh, Ms. Gomez. Okay. Great, thank you, thank you. It's still like feeling like, a, why we can have early bus Santa Cruz? She said, what's going to be have a 71? Mm -hmm. we can well, let's, let's have this conversation. I mean, you, you had your three minutes. Let's talk afterwards. Um, you know, I know we've been working on these. I, I know that um, you've been coming here and the staff seems to be already looking into the, pro the projects that you've been talking about. So let's continue to work with staff and hopefully we can come to resolution. I want to get people to take care of that. Okay. And, and, and get it some piece of solution. It's okay, not great. too much what we're asking. It's safety. And I agree. And right. we can talk about this later. I mean, I know. You, thank you for bringing the, your, this you to our attention. Day, you too. Have a great day. Okay. So um, at this time, uh, anybody else in the public? Then I would like to bring this to labor. Labor reports. He's hobbling to the stand. <laughs> Good morning, board of directors, and um, uh, welcome, um, day one. Yes. Um, um, I just wanted to say, hopefully, we have a, um, a better year than last year. Um, uh, a lot of it has always been our, our issues around, or the mention around communication, and hopefully, we can reach a, a, we reach impasse lately in one of the meetings. Um, so we're, we're um, like I said, it's just um, uh, hopefully it's a better year for all of us. Thank you. Well, Happy New Year to you, too. <laughs> Good morning, board. Uh, I want to uh, thank Alex and the board members, Jimmy, John, and Norm, yesterday for inviting us to uh, meet with uh, uh, Panetta. It was was a good meeting, and um, I, I appreciate it. We appreciate it. Um, I also want to thank or congratulate Devon on your appointment. All right. We look forward to meeting with you or working with you. Hi, my name is Olivia Martinez. I am the staff for SEIU. And I'm not sure if this is a time to just clarify something on the agenda on, on 11.21. I think it's the mechanic reclassification. Mm -hmm. That's fine. Um, okay, so I, I really think. Angela and Jolene for doing all the work and we finally completed that reclassification that I think took us a year. <laughs> but I just wanted to clarify is that SEAU wasn't in agreement to not deal with the compaction issue. It's just that unfortunately we don't have um, contract in our language to deal with compaction issues. Um, but for the sake of moving forward and having this classification be done, I think we were okay with it. But we're hoping that with the salary and comp study that compaction issues that are an issue for a lot of the classifications are addressed through that process. So thank you. Great. Thank you. We'll take note. Anybody else? Okay. Thank you, Labor. Let us move now on to our consent agenda. Um, 
board. Is there anything on the consent agenda you'd like to pull, talk about? Okay. Move approval of consent agenda. Move out to the, and then I'd like to go out to the public. Is there anybody that has comments on, on the um, consent agenda? I think we just heard we'll one. Second the motion. Second. And we have a second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? It was a tie, but um, you can choose between Donna and Bruce. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> ladies first. Both from Scotts Valley, so ladies first. Yes, ma'am. It was, it was, it was just the women's march, so we'll give it to Donna. Feels like, feels like home. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that, that, that unanimously passes. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, so at this point, uh, do you want to go back up to the front again? Sure. Longevity Awards. So, um, nobody's here? Okay. So we're, well, I'll just say really quick in case Juan Flores, Michael Miller, or Pete Lagaretta are here. Okay, you guys are all being honored. Thank you. We will get your awards in the mail. And um, a resolution of appreciation, retiree Arlen Colwell. He's not present. Okay. Well, I would move approval of the resolution. Thank you. And I'll second those. Thank you. All, uh, a first and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? You, abstention? Oh, you're opposing? No, no, no. Oh. no but my question is, is it 12 and 13 that we're doing? 12 and 13, yes. Together, yeah. Um, any abstentions? Okay, this, those clearly pass. <clears throat> Unanimously. <laughs> it was almost, uh, I got a little nervous over here. I thought I almost heard a no. Okay, so uh, 14, Martin, the city manager of Santa Cruz. Welcome, and we will have a presentation on the state of downtown Santa Cruz. Thank you uh, for uh, inviting me here. And uh, I wanted to do a yeah, presentation on the uh, state of the downtown. And uh, first of all, like I said, I want to thank you for the opportunity. And also thank Alex. He was at a city council meeting presenting on the, what the Metro is doing. And, and very much appreciate that. So we thought it would be a good opportunity to also uh, uh, giving an update since the uh, metro station obviously in, in transit is so critical to the city uh, as well as our downtown area. So um, we're going to cover uh, some of these uh, uh, areas here in, in the next slide uh, with respect to some of the, oh, thank you, uh, uh, give you an update on some of the development uh, that's going on downtown uh, and some other efforts to uh, improve the uh, safety and uh, economies of downtown, as well as some of the related issues to, uh, on parking, retail, and transportation. I'll start with uh, the downtown plan, which was recent, recently adopted by City Council. The original downtown plan was approved after the earthquake, and uh, we've uh, uh, revised that accordingly, as much of it has already been implemented. Uh, like I said, it was originally adopted in 1991, as a downtown recovery plan, so we took out the recovery now, since we've pretty much recovered. Uh, this update reflects that we have recovered and that our downtown continues to grow and thrive. Uh, focused on areas in the southern portion of downtown, including Pacific Station, uh, key components include increasing the potential for housing to address our housing crisis, enhance connections to the river walk, and continuing the success of our vibrant commercial district downtown. Uh, past iterations of the Pacific Station project informed uh, some of the choices of height for the area south of Cap Capcart, which were increased in, in the plan. And we're looking forward to the plan implementation and have some upcoming developments uh, on that on the horizon that I'll point out in a few minutes. So those are the, the, the changes, like I said, the south of Capcart area in particular had, and along the river had uh, some height increases there. Uh, in this next slide, you can see some of the uh, uh, opportunity uh, areas. So the orange uh, properties represent proposed or in construction mixed-use housing opportunities. Uh, sites include the 555 Pacific Avenue, which is uh, 94 market rate units by Barry Swenson, and that building is just about complete. It's coming out really, really nice. Um, and then there is the Devcon Waller 200 market uh, rate project, and that's at the, between, on Laurel, Front, and Pacific. Uh, there's also the city-owned uh, parcels adjacent to the Metro Center, the proposed Doug Ross property on Front Street, uh, which is slated for 140 units. That's uh, along uh, between uh, uh, Soquel, along Front Street, uh, between Soquel and 
Laurel Street, uh, right along the river levee, and that'll be a great project because that uh, uh, is uh, contiguous with the river levee. And that's, that's 140 units. And then the 1547 Pacific Avenue, which is the last remaining whole downtown next to Lulu's, and that's 67 units, at, which is currently under construction also by Barry Swenson. Uh, the green properties represent major new or proposed commercial opportunities, including the Abbott Square project, which has been completed recently and has been a tremendous success, and the Warriors Arena. The blue properties are opportunity sites and include the two city surface parking lots behind the University Town Center, uh, which we're looking at for a mixed-use project, and I'll describe that a little later, and behind the Del Mar Theater, which I'll also talk about that one in a little bit, and, of course, the... Uh, current metro site. Uh, so these are our major opportunity sites in our downtown. Uh, this is a conceptual rendering that which represents the proposed uh, city 60 to 100 unit affordable housing project uh, on Pacific Avenue, uh, which is adjacent to the existing metro center and includes the visioning of a public uh, paseo that connects to Front Street and the levee. Uh, the city recently acquired the Nyack building. That was a, about a $6 million acquisition we just completed. Uh, that's the nonprofit insurance building. And combined with the city, uh, the small city parking lot facing Pacific Avenue is moving forward on next steps uh, with respect to a project there. The opportunity to work with Metro and, revi and revision, revise the entire combined footprint together is an exciting opportunity, and we've been working with uh, your staff on, on looking at that. Uh, that could maximize the efficiency of the metro operations with the new bus transit center oriented towards Front Street while providing commercial retail and enhanced pedestrian frontage on Pacific Avenue and affordable housing above. So this is, uh, again, a rendering of uh, what it could look like uh, to create all those uh, opportunities. Like I said, the city's already invested in acquiring the, the land building. Uh, this is another rendering of uh, what the uh, uh, Maple Street Alley could look like. Um, the one thing I should note is that the uh, we wouldn't have a, a, a farmer's market uh, on this site because we're looking at creating a uh, permanent farmer's market, which I'll show you next. So, I think we'll go this way around, show you this one first. So, we're working with the farmer's market uh, to create a permanent home for them. Uh, the farmer's market's operating uh, downtown for many years and is critical, uh, but they really need a permanent home. And so this includes providing uh, amenities uh, or features that they need uh, and they're lacking now. It also provides the opportunity to create a, a new community space because this could be used for any number of events. Uh, uh, it would also continue to function as a parking lot, but uh, would also have a, a pavilion. And this is about another five to six million dollar uh, investment by the city. This is a, an overview of what it would look like from the top. It, could, it would include a plaza. This is all on Front Street and Cathcart. Yes. Yeah. Can, can you say something about where, where in the planning this is? And is it already, I mean, is this a conceptual drawing or some architect can hire to work? Where is this? These happening? are conceptual drawings. We've been working with the farmer's market. We've identified this site. This is their preferred site. Um, and so we're just looking for the farmer's market to finalize that. And uh, uh, then we would move towards uh, making the, the change uh, and, and moving it to, to this location. We've uh, spec'd out the, all the various stalls and how they would all work. They're very excited about it because it would create a very organized, uh, structured farmer's market with the designated spaces, the aisleways, bathroom facilities, uh, the way vehicles come in and out, which vehicles are used and which ones aren't, which are the stands and that sort of thing. And has the council approved this or is it still approved? Not yet. This is conceptual. They've approved the, the, the approach, they've approved the concept and moving forward with that. Uh, and I think everybody also likes the idea of a, of a pavilion because it provides the opportunity for a year-round market, uh, as well as a plaza, and again, the, the opportunity to prove to, for this to be a venue for really a community space for any number of activities. You can have a festival, you can have any number of, of different things. Thank you. Uh, and it would create that permanency, which is what the farmer's market is really looking for. Uh, another major project that we're working on is a mixed-use project. Uh, this is right behind the University Town Center, where the current farmer's market uh, site is. And that's a mixed-use project that would include uh, a new 44,000 square foot uh, library, it would have you know 20 foot high ceilings, uh, and then it would have include a, a office and commercial as well as housing and a parking structure of about 600 uh, parking spaces. This provides the opportunity to combine parking in the downtown, and also facilitates the ability to 
uh, use existing surface lots for higher and better use, which would include housing. That's the direction we received from housing. To really look at our, we have a lot of surface lots, how could those be better used and how could we combine parking to have it be more efficient uh, and more connected to housing. And also, this is very close to obviously transit and the, the metro center there as well. And so this is a project that uh, uh, the library portion of it is completed. We're uh, uh, now going to be bringing this back to council in the next several months. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, too, uh, the viability of downtown is important also from a public safety and cleanliness perspective. And so the city is taking on a strategy to try to address that. As you all know, homelessness is a major issue in the state of California. I recently came back from a conference uh, in, in Long Beach that had uh, officials from all over the country, from New York, uh, Colorado, Texas, uh, to, to talk about homelessness. And the one thing that was really striking to me about that conference and what I've learned is that California just does an incredibly horrible job of sheltering individuals. Like for example, New York, the state of New York has 90,000 homeless people there, but they only have 4,500 unsheltered. Uh, the state of California has 130,000 uh, uh, homeless, but we only, uh, but only 40%, or 30%, 30% are sheltered, 70% are unsheltered. In the, in the city of Santa Cruz, and the county of Santa Cruz, 80% are unsheltered. So a lot of our issue is that individuals are, there's really no place for them to be, uh, and we just don't provide the shelter. And the shelter doesn't mean, you know, permanent housing. It means any variety of different the shelters for, for mental illness, for substance abuse, for families. Uh, and so it's very visible in our communities, and obviously it's been an issue in our downtown. So that's one of the strategies that we're working on is how could we, because again, enforcement is not effective if the police are not able to help those individuals, or whether it's through accountability and the criminal justice system, or a place for them to be. Because uh, otherwise, what it ends up doing is moving people around. So we're trying to get away from that strategy. Uh, we, and this is a, a really important program downtown that gets those individuals uh, on the path to uh, getting out of homelessness. That's what's critical about this program. That's really what this, it's about. While well, people are out there cleaning and making a difference, they're also getting stabilized. They're also referred into programs and services. And it's been incredibly successful thus far. Thus far and we're hoping to expand this program. Uh, they clean the levee. They clean all throughout downtown. Um, and we really want them to do uh, projects throughout the city. And I think other communities are looking at uh, implementing similar programs. Uh, and there are a number of other efforts downtown uh, to, uh, in this area, including uh, the addition of rangers, downtown hosts, uh, outreach workers. Uh, that uh, we, we've been implementing, and again, we're also looking at the, our, our enforcement approach so that we can, we want to conduct effective enforcement downtown, uh, better strategizing and focusing on having a place for people to go so that uh, we're not moving people around, as I mentioned earlier. The other uh, big uh, uh, part of the piece here is, is parking. Um, and so we're currently working with the consulting firm of Nelson, uh, Nelson Nygaard on expanding our downtown parking district uh, over the present 10 and 20 year horizons. Uh, this study includes an analysis of supply and demand for parking, pricing recommendations, and strategic recommendations to support downtown commercial, office, and residential users uh, groups. How parking policy can support and enhance the downtown is really the focus of, of this study. We're working with uh, uh, national retail consultant Bob Gibbs to refresh his 2011 study on recommendations for long-term retail sustainability in the downtown, which has been impacted by the changing face of retail and surging internet sales. And I was talking to uh, Director Botoff uh, just earlier today about uh, the impacts of retailing throughout the, the country, and, and for example, in the mall. And so that, that, that is an impact also on our downtown. Uh, his observations and recommendations include activation of the pedestrian footbridge uh, frontages uh, along Pacific Avenue and considerable beautification and landscaping that uh, we'll be working on implementing these recommendations and overall downtown beautification to support our vital downtown retail corridor. Uh, another uh, major initiative that the city has kicked off again related to uh, the downtown and transit in particular is this year we launched our Go Santa Cruz campaign. Uh, this brings all of our transportation alternative programs under one umbrella. Go Santa Cruz includes the city's ongoing work to expand bike and pedestrian facilities, provides education and encouragement, increases transportation options through programs like Zipcar and Bike Share, and leverages partnerships with other transportation agencies. 
Uh, since 2011, our transportation group has received over $21 million in grant funding to implement transportation projects that increase multimodal options, reduce greenhouse gas emissions, and make our city more livable. And here's some interesting statistics. Uh, one of the reasons that, to do, that we do uh, this was to highlight the success that we've had in constructing infrastructure and partnering on programs that helps to reduce single occupant vehicle travel. Uh, in the city of Santa Cruz, our drive alone rate is almost 20% lower than the national average. Our bike to work rate is the second highest in the state. We've made strides in transit mode share, likely in large part due to the university, so thank you. Our goal is to continue to reduce the rate of driving along through infrastructure and partnerships, leading to a more livable community and reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, we are ready, uh, we're really uh, excited to be rolling out a bike share system uh, in May. We've partnered with Social Bicycles to provide 215 pedal assist bikes to be located at 26 stations around town. Uh, this is great because it's electric pedal assist. Uh, these are a key component to helping close the first mile, last mile problem, as well as offer a great alternative for residents, employees, and visitors to use uh, these bikes to get around without adding car trips to our road network. Uh, we're adding a bike share station at the city parking lot right next to Pacific Station and with the aim of helping people to travel that first leg or last leg of, the, of, the, of their trip, making transit a feasible alternative for even more people. So I think this is a partnership that hopefully will, will help uh, with the, the use of transit and facilitate that use. And so in closing, uh, we're we're excited about everything we have going on in our downtown, and we're proud of the programs that we have underway. A transit, I want to emphasize, is a key component of the success of our downtown. We're excited about our continued partnership with Metro, and we hope to realize a joint project at Pacific Station. Uh, so thank you very much. I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you. Um, I guess at this time, I'd like to bring back to the board. Thank you for your presentation. It's always nice, even though I'm from South County, that knows exactly what's going on in your county, um, in part of the county. So uh, anybody on the board that would like to have questions? Mr. Leopold. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, uh, just a, a quick question. On the two slides you showed about Pacific Station, there was a, a noticeable absence of any buses. So uh, how, how do you envision that project with the, the uh, um, the transit center there. Right, uh, and those are just renderings of the Paseo piece, uh, but uh, one uh, option that makes uh, sense is to orient the station towards Front Street so that you could have continuous uh, frontage along Pacific Avenue, so you could have commercial, uh, retail, and housing um, on the uh, section that the front specific and <coughs> towards the back. You could have the metro station that orients uh, around uh, Pacific. With the acquisition, of the Nyack building and the city parking lot. Obviously that expands the, 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 the base of the area. So you have various options in terms of expanding it and making it wider uh, as opposed to longer and that, that sort of thing. Do you want to add? Yeah, I'll add one piece in there. Uh, Claire Place Slayer, Transportation Planner with the City of Santa Cruz. Uh, we've currently <coughs> been working with Metro staff with uh, Barrow and Pete and Aaron to identify also a consultant to come in and do some further analysis on the operational needs for downtown transit. So one of the questions that that's going to answer is uh, the number of bays that are necessary, the number of labor spaces that are necessary, how transit functions through downtown, and that will really inform uh, the space needs and the orientation and um, facilitate how that project looks as well. So I remember we, uh, we talked about this at, at the Metro Board several months ago, so we haven't moved forward on, on that. That's the same study the city's contributing $25,000 to. Correct, and we actually finished <coughs> consultant interviews a week and a half ago, right. and um, maybe Aaron could get an update on where that is, but we did select the preferred consultant. Right. Yes. Devon? How, how do people want to take the bikes? Uh, this is one of my favorite things to talk about. Uh, the city was able to negotiate a no-cost to the city contract with our vendor, Social Bicycles. So Social Bicycles uh, takes on all of the capital and operational costs. They also get all of the um, financial revenues that come through user fees. So um, we facilitate, our uh, city contribution to it is facilitating through the encroachment permitting process, uh, coordination with neighboring businesses and residents, and doing uh, a lot of the promotion and publication of the program, but there is a no cost to the city contract. And for a job, you should get close to the Oh, okay. Okay. So, for example, it's not off the televised. Oh, okay. So, for accountability, how will they deal with bike theft? 
Oh, that's a great question. Yeah. So each and every one of the bikes has a GPS on board, which is monitored 24-7, uh, 365. So at any point in time, we can find where that bike is in real time. In order to check out a bike, you need to have a valid credit card linked to a unique user ID. So you create a user account and then you check out that bike. So that bike is tied to you from the time that you check it out until you return it. Uh, in terms of bikes that are left locked up when not in use, uh, these bikes are made to be theft and vandal resistant in as many ways as possible. All the components are custom. You cannot use standard tools. Uh, it's essentially one big welded together piece. All the components that you could think of that would normally be easy to remove, like a seat, they have a, um, a thing in the a ball at the bottom of the seat post making it unable to be removed. The pedals can't be removed. Um, and typically what our vendors found, this is one of the big questions they get asked, that maybe in the first week of bikes being out, uh, a couple people will try to steal the bikes, and then they realize it's not doable, A, and B, that there's no resale value for any of the parts because they can't be swapped out for anything else besides these custom bike share bikes. So lots of ways that we're looking at them and vandalism to adjust. Wow. <laughs> Pretty detailed. You are really, like, proactive about that. Yeah, that was a very good question. Sultan, you mentioned beforehand, so that is that the way we're going to determine how many bikes are going to be there? The or do you have an idea of how many bikes are going to be there? I would assume that would be, out of all the bays you would have in the, in the city of Santa Cruz, that will have the most because that is our metro station. Yes. So how, what's the amount of bikes you have? Yes, yeah, so we'll have 26 station locations throughout town. In the downtown, there will be five, including the one adjacent to Pacific Station. We're anticipating there will be about 20 bikes uh, near Pacific Station. One of the other things about downtown, because we're investing, not, we're partnering, on a, uh, what could be a dockless bike share system, we are going to geofence the entirety of the downtown area, which means that you can, there'll be five official stations in downtown, but if you're gonna go to say, um, Chianti's, and there's not a bike share station in front, you can walk up to a regular bike rack, and that's counted the entirety of downtown as a regular station. Um, so there will be about 20 bikes located directly adjacent to Pacific Station, but there'll be other locations throughout the downtown that you can pick up and drop off bikes. Great. Thank you, and I applaud you for your anti-theft efforts in the city of Santa Cruz. <laughs> so, yeah, I appreciate it. Thank that. you. That sounds like there's a lot of effort and work going into this, and good luck with your... Uh, oops, I... Yeah, I, I just wanted to ask, uh, congratulations on an ambitious, forward-looking, wide-ranging program that you have there. It's um, very detailed, but with the... Um, the dissolution of uh, uh, redevelopment agencies and so forth. Uh, what, how much federal state support these types of programs? I mean, the city obviously is not going to be able to fund at all. What are you counting on? Are there new programs that are coming on or that you're pushing for? Or? Right. Uh, some, a portion of it is from, <coughs> excuse me, some of it was from, we did have some redevelopment uh, 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 bonds that were, were still retained. But for example, that helped with the acquisition of the. Uh, uh, Nine purchase, uh, as well as for some of the downtown improvements. So we still have some remaining redevelopment bond funds uh, that uh, have contributed to this. It's not like you said anything at all. Like uh, when we have redevelopment, uh, and then the other portion really is just partnerships. Uh, it's it's grants. Uh, it's also partnerships uh, with uh, private uh, developers. Much of the housing is uh, privately developed, and so um, we're there it's really working on how can we partner to. Uh, provide opportunities for a larger amount of affordable housing. Like for example, with the Dead Farm Project, one of the things we're looking at there is, uh, the, can we acquire some properties adjacent to them, and then potentially share the parking and construct the, because uh, we own the properties, uh, the land, um, uh, how can we maximize the amount of affordable housing? And that's what we're hoping we can, by owning the land, by partnering with the private developers and going out with a, a with a, a potentially nonprofit housing developer to create you know 600 uh, units of affordable housing uh, without a general fund impact on the city. Um, additionally, for local funding, we passed a library bond and a uh, transportation measure, which enable us to have some additional funding to go towards our downtown library and many of our transportation projects. So we're really thankful to the voters for that as well. Thank you, thank you. Cynthia Matthews, like, for that. Yeah, uh, for that, uh, <laughs> with respect to the mixed use project uh, that uh, Claire mentioned with the library, we have, we have the parking fund too. So again, it's really just how do you leverage what you have and partner to create uh, uh, you know, opportunities uh, so that uh, there's uh, uh, the ability to get these projects moving forward. You have to be creative. Yeah. Great. Thank you for your presentation. We really appreciate it. You're welcome. Thank, thank you, you for the opportunity. Sure. Thank you. All right, moving on to our next um, part of the agenda, which will be quick and Angela brief. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, 
please, the board, I'd like to take number 15 and number 16 together. And then I would also like to um, take number 16, just uh, have you go to 16A1. I'm not going to put the presentation up there today in the interest of time. You go to page 16A. The most important page. 16A12. 16A12 tells you exactly where we stand year to date on our expense side. Right now we have 53% of our personnel in savings, and we have about 47% of the non personnel in savings. We have about a million five that we are in, have not uh, spent to date. And on the revenue side through October, we are um, on task for revenues. Our uh, sales tax revenue is coming in above what we anticipated, and our um, passengers. Revenue is coming in about 17% below the uh, our ridership is at. Between those two, we're dead even on the revenue side, but we are saving money on the expense side. And the passenger up being down has to do with the routes that we cut primarily, or is there some other theory of why we're down in the Fair. Fair. Good question. A quick two-part answer. As we we've now been a year since the service reduction, so unfortunately we're comparing to ridership afterwards, so we can't blame it per se on the service reduction. As you will get a presentation in February in some detail on this top topic, we're dealing with the nationwide trend of dropping transit ridership. Fortunately, in the case of UCSC, our ridership is so strong there is masking a system-wide issue that we're coming to grips with, so I'd like to speak to more detail of that in February. But yes, the regular local services are suffering a bit of decline. A pretty common pattern having to do with employment, low prices of gas, increased car ownership, et cetera, et cetera. It's a tough game right now. Thank you. Okay, Angela, that's it? We're good. Oh my God, you are I, my favorite today. Thank you. I would move to accept the Okay, John. Okay, we have first and the second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? This unanimously passes. Okay, so. <clears throat> welcome back. So, the number 17 is accepting the financial statements with the independent auditor report for the year 1830 2017. Again, in the interest of time, I'm going to have our uh, accountant, uh, Lorraine, come out and talk to you about some of the specific details about our audit. Good morning. So I'm going to keep this short and sweet also. Um, today we are presenting the annual audited financial statements and the auditor's report for your acceptance. Um, attachment A is the actual audit report and the financials. Um, these are our financials, um, they're our responsibility. The auditors merely provide their professional opinion. For fiscal year 17, they have offered us an unmodified opinion, which is a clean opinion. The financial statements are presented in all material respects. Um, the financial position of the agency, and they are not materially misstated. There are no findings for compliance for TDA, for PTMSEA, there are no single audit findings for our federal awards. Attachment B is a SAS 114 letter. It's a required communication that the auditors um, must relate to those who are in charge of governance or the board. Um, they need to um, relate any audit adjustments that were made and any difficulties or disagreements that they had with management. And there were none this year. Attachment C is what our auditors are calling an agreed upon conditions letter. This letter um, is an opportunity to relay um, uh, I, recommendations that can strengthen our internal control and our operations efficiency. Now this is not a SAS 115 letter, which you may have seen um, with other audits that would identify significant deficiencies or material weaknesses. Those would be reportable conditions. These are not that. This is merely a letter um, to informally relate uh, best practices recommendations for a couple of, of items that the auditors um, it was came to their attention. 
Auditors often, can, often consider this type of a letter as a, as a value-added service to the clients. So I want to emphasize that this doesn't carry the weight or the severity of a 115 letter. The two conditions that have been identified are summarized in the AUC letter and its um, attachment C. These issues have already been on our radar, and it's good to know that we are on the same page as the auditors. Um, Angela, our finance manager, is working with the customer service staff currently and with um, the ticketing software and hardware vendor GFI to implement these recommendations. Um, we plan to meet in March with the finance budget and audit committee in March to present an update about the status of our corrective actions for these two conditions. Thank you. Okay. Any questions from the board? Uh, motion to accept the reports uh, by Rodkin, seconded I by Leopold. Congratulate all of our staff mm -hmm. on having a clean audit report. It's really great that we have no findings of being at a last So noted. Okay, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Passes unanimously. Okay, we'll go to number 19, Jolene. Um, the description for the assistant human resource manager position. Building Church, Human Resource Manager. Uh, actually, that was uh, item number 18.1, correct? Yes, 18. Do what I say? Okay. Yeah, connect. Cool. Sorry. All right. So, <laughs> I just wanted to bring before the board um, actually 18 and 19 are revisions to a few of our existing job specifications. 18 is a revision to the job description for the Assistant Human Resource Manager, which is currently a vacant position. We made uh, some just minor tweaks to this uh, job spec to make sure that the needs of the organization and the job specification uh, would, would make for a good recruitment. We want to get the right person in, and so focusing on the competencies needed for the job was very important, and we wanted to make sure that we got this right. So brought before the board here the revision to the job description, um, recommending that the board uh, approve the revised job description. Okay, questions from the board? Mike? Can I ask if um, either of these jobs are affected by the compaction that the union representative uh, discussed with us? or was, what, are, what are our expectations of the hiring uh, ability given where these things are yeah. going? That's, that's a great question. So the, the manager's comp plan, um, none, of, none of our existing uh, salary structures really address compaction issues because we don't have a formalized uh, compaction um, it's not addressed in a formal methodology for um, setting forth salaries. And so that's part of, of the upcoming discussion on classification um, and, and comp study. So, so no. Um, however, in reviewing uh, the job specification, we want to make sure first, and that's why uh, as we speak later on the classification comp study, we want to make sure that we have the right job description uh, to be able to move forward. And then we can actually comp out. And so in moving forward with this action, we're able to actually get the right person in. And then um, later, as, as we review our compensation, uh, then we can address things like compaction and, and that. But I don't see uh, an egregious uh, challenge with getting a person in the door uh, with the given salary structure and, and this revised uh, job spec. And what's our timeline for this hiring? As soon as you approve this, I am <laughs> hitting the streets with this one. <laughs> okay, any more questions from yeah, the board? Could you, Cynthia? Um, can you, could you give us just a brief idea of what, what were the updates and changes? The updates and changes are mostly just to align with the industry and not make this so um, tunnel vision. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes we, we set our job descriptions so, so focused on um, specific tasks rather than the broad competencies that we really uh, end up crippling ourselves in the hiring process. And so when we are painting an accurate, actual, uh, accurate picture of what a day in the life of the job looks like, examples of duties should be a pretty good indication of the true examples of the duties, yet they're not all inclusive. But what we should be able to glean from the knowledge, skills, and abilities based in a job description it are the competencies required. And those those were the small tweaks that were made so that we made sure we captured the right competencies for this particular position. We have 
uh, a very, very short uh, management, flat management structure here. And so it's really important in these key management positions to get the right person with the right skill set so that we can accomplish a lot of work. Okay, thank you. Devon? Uh, specifically, our, oh, oh, I, I keep forgetting this. Um, for the salary, is it adjusted for the cost of living in Santa Cruz? Would you say it, it adequately will support someone to live here? So as we'll discuss with the upcoming item with the CPS study, um, the management uh, the management comp has never been done. So these have just kind of been set and and things have been kind of adjusted. The cost of living um, has been kind of considered as a kind of a backside factor into um, putting this together in the past. Now we're taking the steps to actually do it right. But that's that's not in the job spec. The the actual compensation piece is not in this job spec. Thank you. Any other questions from the board? Okay. Um, public, we'd like. Is there anybody from the public who'd like to comment on this? Molly hobbles out. Trying. <laughs> uh, good morning, Eduardo Montesino. Just uh, just for historical, uh, you know, a lot of the compassion issues uh, for the union side, both of us. We dealt during negotiation. That's what I think there's an as, it's an absent language in, in, in both countries. So that's that's what we historically have dealt with compassion issues. So now, Anyone else? Okay. A sec okay. Second. Okay, first a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? This unanimously passes. And the second was who I'm sorry? Leopold. Okie doke. So. Go recruit. <laughs> <laughs> Jolene. All right, I'm on again. All right. So this is the second of, of the job uh, descriptions that were changed. So this is for the safety, security, and risk manager. This is a highly important position in, in a transit industry, as you can all imagine. And I've successfully recruited for a safety risk manager in my prior employment very, very difficult if you don't have the job spec right. And so the revisions to this particular spec, um, again, got rid of the tunnel vision nature and really focused on the organizational needs for a, a safety and risk officer who really understands the needs of transit. Uh, very specific with DOT and FTA. We just want to make sure that we get the right person in. So just some small refinements here to make sure that we can meet the needs. And our needs have changed. Um, as industry regulations and compliance have changed over the years, our needs have changed. And so the job spec uh, reflects the, the, changing, the changes in the industry and regulation over the years. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, board, any questions? Okay, um, in the public? No one in the public? All right. Second. It's rocking. Ms. Matthews? Thank you. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstain? This passes. Okay, Alex, you're on. Establishment of passenger code of conduct and services, suspension, exclusion policies. Wait, geez, Louise, I'm doing this today. I, I think I want to end this meeting. That's what I want to do. It's like, I'll just be over. <laughs> Jolene, you're on again. <laughs> yeah. It's every other item until this is over. I was told earlier <laughs> Odd to, to hurry this up. Yeah. All right, this, this, this one I'm, I'm really excited to bring you. We, uh, we took before the uh, personnel committee um, our, our findings from the CPS HR consulting management classification and comp study. We did uh, phase one of the classification study, which was a review of the current uh, structures in the management unit, the job descriptions, uh, we made revisions. We went through a very interactive process on this uh, with a position uh, description questionnaire, went through all of each job with a fine tooth comb, highly involved with staff and with the folks at CPS to make sure that we accurately recorded what folks in this organization are doing and may need to do in the future. So again, getting away from tunnel vision of what we've done in the past, um, looking at what we do today, and considering what we may do in the future so that we accurately drafted some great new job descriptions. So our job descriptions have tweaked. Um, 
some of the uh, titles, of, you'll see that actually the titles of many of our positions, uh, many went from a manager to a director, that um, clearly uh, aligns with the industry. And, and it really puts, um, imagine going to an industry conference and you hear a title of manager versus director. And in your mind, you've actually placed that person mentally where they, their hierarchy in the organization, and whether you're going to listen to them. Uh, we don't need to dilute um, the, the authority of any of our management, just in title alone. And that can happen. Um, so it's very important that we have the hierarchy in place, that structure in place, so that we can accurately move forward with the compensation. Um, and so when we went before the personnel committee, we proposed um, looking at a methodology, which is what we've been talking about, about compaction. Without having any type of compensation policy, we go into a, a classification comp study looking at comparable salaries without any fixed methodology. So this uh, proposal to the personnel committee, this presentation, I should say, to the pre to the personnel committee, and that presentation is in your packet, was um, to go over the components of what's in a methodology of, of compensation policy. And that can be anything from setting salary ranges 5% uh, below the median, at median, above the median. It also takes into consideration total compensation. What are our our uh, agency's peers paying uh, in purse contributions, in fringe benefits, and all of these components that go into why someone would come to work here. And oftentimes we look at the bottom line salary, but we're not looking at total compensation. We want to make sure that people see the big picture of what Metro has to offer. We have a wonderful benefits package, and we have a lot to offer someone. So we want to make sure that that's um, accurately communicated, and so our, our compensation policy moving forward, um, we, we're just now with the correct job descriptions that we've proposed here in the CPS study, um, moving into phase two, which would be that market analysis phase, and that would, we'd need to determine what that methodology is. So going forward with the personnel <coughs> committee, they've decided, hey, we can't make any financial decisions how to achieve a methodology if we don't even know the financial impacts, why would we want to make a decision uh, if we don't even know what this could mean to the organization? So let's look at that. So CPS is going to be bringing back uh, to the personnel committee uh, an actual analysis that shows the salaries in our approved, we have 11 agencies in our, in our comparable agency market basket. They're going to be looking at the salaries of all of the positions that they would be comping against and then providing an actual spreadsheet that shows uh, the median range, the 5% uh, above, 5% below, what that looks like, and then we can analyze the financial impacts that making one of those decisions would make. This is key, and this study has taken a bit of time because we want to make sure we get this right. And we have one shot to do it right. Management has never been done. Uh, why not start with a unit that's never been done? Uh, so that we can we can really start shaping um, this organization as compensation policy in the right direction. Thank you, Jolene. And mm -hmm. questions from the board? I know Mike. No. Comment. Oh, oh, but not not comments yet. Just questions. Yeah. Cynthia. Um, <clears throat> I'm, I'm curious. Uh, you talk about a salary uh, study, and then you also reference total compensation. What's the percentage of total compensation that's non-salary benefits. It's, it's huge. Yeah, the fringe is represents roughly 40% yeah. is the loaded so, on top. So that's my question as mm -hmm. this goes forward. There's one of the pages here that talks about the board discussion setting pay ranges, mm -hmm. but where do you talk about the consideration of total compensation? So total compensation comes into the, into the big picture of that. Um, setting pay ranges uh, at wherever you're going to in market um, is a separate component of the total compensation right. piece. Yeah. Um, but that's a part of the bigger conversation. And the affordability comes in there. And that's when you look at 
uh, all of the fringe, and where you've determined would be a great place to set your compensation. Um, at, you, you have that conversation kind of as a whole. So we look at um, what, are the, what are those peers offering right. in, in their total compensation package. And if we're going to be um, pegged against, say, 5% above, median, or below, is that an accurate reflection of the total compensation in, the, um, in our basket? And how competitive uh, does that make us? So that, uh, I, I understand yeah. that. So will that kind of analysis be in the next phase here? In the, in the next, the very next thing that's coming forward is to um, set forth um, what, what the 5% mm -hmm. um, and median looks like. Uh, so that the personnel committee can can actually assess that before we we move into that. But yes, there will be a spreadsheet that will include all of these components, so that the personnel committee can look at all of that big picture um, before making yeah financial impact. Yeah, that's an absolutely huge huge consideration to take into into account. Any more questions? Mr. Leopold. Can you just remind us what the timeline is for all this? So the timeline, now that we're moving into <coughs> the next phase two, we have a couple months, uh, about, about eight weeks time to perform this compensation analysis piece. And we'll be presenting back to the personnel committee with that next piece. So before the end of fiscal year, we'll be completely done with, with this particular classification comp study. Um, but like I said, we've we don't want to rush through this. We've um, we've taken our time. We've uh, really applied some due diligence here. Um, the revisions, just since I have joined the organization in in October, uh, have have been just an enormous amount of going back and forth and making sure things are right. So, I anticipate the end of fiscal or the beginning of fiscal, and um, just over the next couple of months, we'll have comp done. Yeah, I just think it's important for us to remember that the, over the next couple of years, we're going to be having a lot of, um, uh, we're going to be entering into negotiations with our unions as well, and so we have to make sure that we have something that is financially doable for all of our employees, not just some of our employees. Any more questions? Okay, public? Comments, questions from the public? I have one question. Just come up to the podium. Eduardo Montesino, um, it's just like I said at the um, uh, personnel commission, is uh, uh, just a concern. You know, um, uh, for many many years, the district has has been able to um, build people up, um, like Aaron, you know, April, Anna in the back. Um, uh, they uh, we build on employees here, to take on these, uh, and with the minimum requirements, it's going to be really hard uh, with all that education. Thank you. Next. Yeah, I just have a question about um, comparable, talking about comparing uh, Santa Cruz Metro Transit District with other agencies. In making that comparison, is that com uh, including the uh, cost of living in Santa Cruz? Uh, I mean, are we comparing ourselves to similar cost of living areas? The, um, well, just the, 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 board, the, the unions and the, um, the management sat down together and they agreed on the comparable cities that will be used in this for this study, so um, I, I believe everything was taken in, into consideration. They range if when you look at the cities that are being compared. So some we are, you know, it, I think believe Santa Clara was one of them, and and you know their their cost of living is probably more expensive than ours. But then you have some that are lower. So I think there's a wide range, and that was kept into consideration that you had a, a you know a fair representation of different um, cities. Well, is that is that documented? Um, that is, and I think that we can find it is on the website or. It's, 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 it's in the report. So, thank you. You're welcome. Next, any more questions from the public? Okay, uh, Jolene. Anybody? Any, now, um, comments from the board. Mike, Mr. Rockin. John Leopold. John Leopold made my first point, which is we should. You have to understand that whatever we decide in this comp study uh, is the appropriate way to go. For example, the eleven <coughs> comparable agencies. The issue of whether we want to pay above, you know, five percent above the market or. 5% below, will also have to be applied to all of the SEIU employees, maybe a little less directly to the bus drivers, but it has an impact. And so we have to understand, you know, we, we say, well, we can afford that for the managers, but if you can't afford it for everybody in the agency, you can't do it. So we really need to see the implications of this before we decide which way to go. 
I also note that the um, 11 comparable agencies, some of them are huge, way bigger than we are. Uh, some of them are smaller. You know, a lot of them are in the Bay Area, so you know, we're not comparing ourselves to Arkansas or something. This is, I mean, <laughs> seriously, this is, no. we are already in a, you know, an expensive market, and a lot of, most of our comparables are in this expensive market. Not all of them, but most of them as well. Um, the, uh, the reality of this uh, study I mean, is, is going to be difficult. What we'll, we'll end up with is very clear. We'll internally have a clear sense of how people's job, in terms of their pay for the relate to each other, as well as whether we're paying for, for this kind of work. And it sort of means that we should be in a good position to hire people. And you might decide, well, let's pay it. If you end up deciding to pay 5% above the median, it makes it a lot easier to hire people from outside to come in to a very expensive place to buy a house and everything else. But again, if the end result of that is we're going to pay people, you know, make our job easier recruiting people, but the end result is we have to cut routes to make that happen, that's not a very wise decision. So the personnel department uh, committee decided we're not going to make that decision the board. We might look at that and make some recommendations, but hopefully the board as a whole needs to understand that question and weigh in because it, it really is a, it's going to be a big dollar figure if you decide you're going to go 5% above. It's not going to be trivial. It's going to make a big impact. And we don't want to do this in a way that ends up getting routes. And I'll say this for our employees. They've always been supportive of, of our passengers and the public. And so we have to work together on this and come up with a, a, a system that works for us, but that doesn't, um, that, you know, it's fair for people, but also that allows us to pay people and not just reduce our system to pay for it. Right. Thank you. Yes. Donna. Yeah, and I think that's something all of, the, all of the jurisdictions are dealing with. We have a position, I know in Scotts Valley, we haven't been able to attract a qualified applicant, um, and we've left it open and using contract because we, we can't boost that salary and then just, you know, make, make one, to get one position but, su but be unable to um, sustain the other salaries and things. So, you know, it's definitely... You know, the committee has and, and staff have a challenging situation, but I think that's what we're all looking at is it is hard to recruit in Santa Cruz County. It's hard for us, it's hard for, uh, you know, people to afford to live in our communities, um, but it's also hard to recruit qualified employees, and that's going to be a balancing act that's going to take a lot of discussion. I also want to add that the, I think we were, I speak for myself, I was very impressed with the consultant yeah. we've hired. I think the rest of the committee was as well. We had a sense that they really know what they're doing and they understand what we're facing as a district in terms of the work that they're doing. I agree. I thought the consultant was really excellent. So, Norm. Bruce, anyone else? Well, I just wanted to repeat what Mike, uh, uh, Super uh, Director Rockman said that this uh, the consultant from, uh, firm is, is fantastic, I thought, in really trying to set a, a framework where we can be realistic in what we can offer without depleting the, the service system that we are all responsible for. So uh, it was they've done a tremendous job, a first big step, and as a member of the committee I'm very impressed and I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing how we can implement this as quickly as possible. Uh, it's about time. Yeah, and I think once we see the numbers then we'll make our decision, but we don't, we haven't seen the numbers yet, so right. that is to be TBD, right? Yes. One of the things too is the relationship that we have as board members to Mr. Barrow and the actual running of the routes and the changing of the routes and making them feasible financially. And I think this is part of the process that really we have to deal with constantly. Secondly, we need to fill all of the management positions. Marketing is one of them that I think we really need to come into focus because it is a necessity to our entire system. Especially with the decline of ridership, which is yes. what I hear 17% this morning. So that's a big number, guys. So we got to work on that, and I think that might be a good idea. So any other comments on this? OK, um, at this time, can I get a, the board of directors approved uh, motion? I'll so move. OK, we'll just do it right here. First and second, Cynthia and Bruce. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstain? This unanimously passes. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, now <clears throat> I'm going to double check this. Alex, you are next. Okay. 21. I'm 21. Okay, thank you. Mr. Chair, directors. Um, 
this item is before you uh, because we don't have a passenger code of conduct and everybody else does. Need I say more? Yeah, but I will. Uh, so uh, this is an important policy for us. Um, as I indicated, other transit properties have code of conduct uh, policies. Um, you know, behavior on a, on a bus or a paratransit vehicle for the most part should be common sense, but uh, unfortunately it isn't. And people do things that uh, we would not want to have them do. Those things can create uh, problems, challenges for our bus operators, our paracruise operators, and certainly uh, inconvenience and help and, and result in uh, our passengers feeling uncomfortable. Yes. Um, we want our passengers to feel good and feel safe when they're on our system so that they'll keep coming back to ride our system. Uh, we do not want them to go back to their car uh, as the current trend seems to be. So this, this what you have before you is the uh, adoption of a new policy uh, for both of the fixed route and then you have also one for paracruise. And, uh, what we'll do if you adopt this is we'll go forward with an education campaign. We'll use the car cards and the buses to try to communicate uh, some basic principles and also to get people to go to a place to look for the more detail that you find in the code of conduct policy. Uh, and then uh, we'll likely put, put a little bit of money into a brochure that we can uh, consolidate uh, this information into and then also reference the more detailed policy. Um, with that introduction, I'd like to turn it over to our general counsel, maybe to talk a little bit about the legal aspects of having a policy. Thank you. Um, yeah, thank you. I, I've been a big proponent of adopting this policy since I started to support Metro. Um, you know, I've met with operators and staff. I've read a lot of incident reports. I've fielded customer complaints. And there, there are a lot of disruptive passengers on Metro. And, you know, the drivers deserve to have a safe workplace. And customers, as Alex said, deserve to have a safe uh, transit experience. And the behaviors, you know, aren't always the type that law enforcement is going to help with. And, and they aren't always the type that you would, you would be successful in getting a judge to tell the person you can't ride the service. Um, but they may rise to the level that we don't want those folks to be on the buses. Um, you know, the punishment should fit the crime, um, and that's that comes in the administration of the policy. Um, and, and by the way, that's fully supported by FTA um, civil rights regulations and FTA guidance. Um, so it's an important tool for Metro to have you know, in addition to working with law enforcement when appropriate. And um, in terms of, you know, the legal aspects of, in terms of what our duties, um, since we are a government, government agency, we do have to give folks due process when we're talking about removing a governmental service. Um, this isn't a fundamental right like, you know, free speech or something. But especially for folks that have disabilities or are transit dependent, you know, there needs to be notice, there needs to be um, an <coughs> educational process, and there's also an appeals process built into the administration. Um, so folks can have the right to come and say, you know, and I think I envision an interactive process where folks would come with maybe, if appropriate, a caregiver and say, you know, look, I did behave badly. Um, you know, perhaps I was, you know, not taking medicine I should be taking, and now I'm working with my caregiver, I'm going to be doing that, and, I, and give me a chance to ride the bus, and I will behave and not scare people, um, you know, because that's important. And so, um, so that's the process, you know, it's, it's legally, you know, um, justified, and I think, you know, important in terms of safety. For, for your drivers and for your passengers. Thank you. And just in closing, uh, the process of getting to this point uh, included the gathering of similar types of policies from a number of agencies and looking at what they had. Some had much more simplistic policies, some had way more complicated policies. Um, Julie has just been incredible in helping us uh, come to the final draft that we have here today for you. 
Uh, and then before meeting today, we've met with both the SEIU and UTU to receive their feedback and incorporated a number of changes as a result of those meetings. Thank you. Any questions from the board? Mr. Leopold. Uh, just a couple questions. <clears throat> uh, we got a letter in here from UCSC about, about emotional support at animals. And uh, I'm just curious, that, that seems to be, we see a lot more uh, support animals out there in the world. And is it generally going to be that the driver is going to have to make the determination whether someone is an emotional support animal? I mean, how does that work? So you don't currently allow emotional support animals. You're in compliance with DOT ADA regulations, which allow service animals. So, so that letter was asking the board to consider, as a matter of policy, to open up your service to allow emotional support animals. And that's not anything I'm recommending. I, I, we haven't even analyzed that. Um, uh, so I get that. But, but so the question is, I've come on the the uh, bus, I want to get on with my dog. How does, how does someone determine whether it's a ADA compliant uh, service dog or an emotional support animal? You know, that. So, so I don't have your policy in front of me when, and I can look at that. And then operationally, I'm not exactly sure what happens in the field. And Eduardo, feel free to <laughs> chime in on that one. You know, almost, you know, 100% of the time, um, uh, they reference it to service animal. Um, um, we don't question what, what, uh, what the uh, services that they provide, although uh, uh, the policy allows us to, but that just gets into people's disabilities and we don't want yeah. to have that conversation. Right. Um, um, but it, it's, a, it's a thought because we are getting, you know, a, a, a people asking for comfort animal and uh, we have denied people uh, because of our, of our policy. So they don't say anything, you just let them on, you don't question it, but no, they say they, this they, is... Yeah, they, they, they usually, you know, like I said, almost, they say it's a service animal. But if they say, oh, this is a comfort animal, then you guys are, then, you say, yeah, you no. Know. We, do, uh, we, don't, we don't support the, you know, okay. comfort animal. Is that related to size of the animals? I mean, I, you know, I've seen yeah. chihuahuas. Uh, no, it's not, it, 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 it's not related to anything, because I, I recently we dealt with, with a few months ago, I think, with someone carrying a little bird. Yeah. Oh. Um, and, you know, what a little bird and their hands is going to do, but you know, you know, I don't know. You know? <laughs> uh, uh, but it's, it, you know, it, it's about, we're, like I said, we're Santa Cruz, we're unique. I know, I know, um, but I, I know uh, administration wants to go, you know, centralized, centralized like everyone else, but, uh, uh, but we always, you know, function differently. You know, from the um, Santa Cruz arm to a lot, uh, uh, we've been uh, more reckless, so it's up to you guys. Well, I mean, do you feel like the, the, this, the way it's currently written, gives you that, uh, gives the drivers the ability to, to the backup necessary? Yes and, and no, um, because it, it, it just, you know, uh, like I said, philosophically, uh, you know, I don't, I, I, I wish we wouldn't have a, co a code of conduct because it just, it, to me, it's like the Ten Commandments, you can't write, it's like kicking people off. That's not, uh, as, a bus, uh, uh, as a bus operator, you know, I want more people in yeah, than, yeah. Uh, uh, than out. But, um, but this is the, um, where the community is at. We, we do have a lot more behavior problems. And, uh, and that's what, uh, you know, uh, what a lot of, you know, our, 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 our comments were. It's a behavior, um, not in regards to, um, you know, uh, service I have. Because we, we, uh, we're pretty late. Okay. Uh, on those as long as they, they say it's a service animal. It should, it should be a dog, though. Yes. Yeah, uh, yes, Miss Matthews was, yeah. was going to come in. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, but like, she has... the the um, the um, the person that came on with with a bird, she was saying a a, 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 a companion. Yeah, but Miss Matthews was actually just saying a good point uh, here. You know, we've had experience in Santa Cruz, and people can say this boa constrictor is my service is my emotional support snake. This this rat. Right. This. Yeah, yeah. this money, this whatever. So I'm. But it's a, but under ADA, it's a very wide latitude. You can bring him being a, a pony. Anyway, so, but yeah. some people are. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So but I, I, just if I could clarify, uh -huh. um, there's there's ADA regs under the Department of Justice, which that's probably what applies to the city of mm -hmm. Santa Cruz, and there's ADA regs under the Department of Transportation, and that's what applies to to Metro, and it's only dogs 
and you have a you have a separate policy for service dogs. So under ADA DOT. I'm agreeing. Yeah. Thank you. So yeah. like, <laughs> for the public, yeah, it's not broad. Donna. Metro. Well, I'm not, I still have a couple other oh questions. Uh, uh, questions. Um, and, and I appreciate the remarks that we ask our drivers to do a lot and uh, to try to assess uh, animals is just one more thing that we should be aware that we're asking our drivers to do. Um, the, the qu other question I had, I appreciate that we've talked with our, our labor organizations, but have we talked with our, um, our uh, metro riders, uh, you know, the MAC or elderly and disabled? I mean, it, it seems like this is the, a code of conduct affecting our riders we should also just use these advisory boards. Uh, I don't recall whether we took it to the, uh, the MAC. I will tell you that the interface with the customers uh, has been a driving force. Um, we receive so many complaints about these kinds of things that you see in this report. Sure. Um, and there are periods of time in which certain things are real hot button issues. And, Lately, it's been putting other belongings on a seat and taking up more than one seat. No, I, I, I saw that. I just think we should use our, our rider advisory groups when we're talking about policies that affect our riders, right? I mean, I think it would be worthwhile before this came back for final approval to, to use the MAC um, and uh, the elderly and disabled uh, a transit group just to, uh, just to get their reflections. We, this is a This is actually... Well, I thought it said that, that they were going to make any, uh, look at any changes that we suggested and then come back for final approval. No, this is, this is put before you for final approval. We can, if you have changes, obviously we would go back and make those changes to it. Uh, I think what you might be thinking of is the final bullet in which we have to go back and incorporate on the Paracruise side um, some changes into their uh, Paracruise guide. Well, my suggest I, I appreciate all the work that went in, and, and it, this is not to to uh, uh, dismiss any of that. I just think we have these advisory groups. We we, we should at least ask them uh, and have this come back uh, to us after we get uh, any uh, suggestions or recommendations. I would benefit from that as a director. Miss Lind. Yeah, my only uh, when we're talking about sopranos, I just had seen some news coverage that the transportation, as far as the airlines have developed policy and have dealt with it because of some of the problems they had with um, a wide, it being abused, emotional support animals being abused. And um, so I would assume when you're talking about ADA regulations and transportation, that, that some of that new research and their work will make that job easier, so. Norm? <clears throat> there are two or three components that are coming from Norm the writer. One is the people coming on with their push baskets. Uh, sometimes they have those things so loaded, they can't possibly collapse them. And they will take up the other side of the handicap places, loaded for bear. And they take up not one, but three places plus uh, the uh, ones for wheelchairs. Two, the fact that I actually was accosted physically twice by two different men uh, wanted to really take it out. Come on, let's go. Uh, on a bus. And this type of thing, when it is seen by other passengers, I mean, I don't think we have recovered from this one gentleman. I know when I. I can get out of my chair now and again take a couple of steps, as you know. And he wanted, to, right there on my bus, and I'm sitting in my chair, he wanted to deck me right there. These are the type of things that we have to deal with. And anything we can come up with, contact, I'm saying as a writer, but most of all, I'm saying not only me, but the other elderly and disabled men and women who are a heck of a lot worse off than I am, have to put up with one or two passengers that are, I've put in requests to keep a couple of these people off the buses. And after six months, they came back on. There wasn't, wasn't any change. Thanks, Storm. Oh, sorry, you're not done? So are there any questions? We'll get back to comments when we after they go to the public, but a question or comment? I had a comment. 
Okay, well, let's say the comments. Any questions? I, uh, you, you say this is a regular occurrence. I mean, are we talking about every day, a couple times, or how often is it going on? I was, I would say maybe once or twice a month. Yeah, it, 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 that's that's the physical part. But on when you're talking about the baskets, it's every day and almost every week. <coughs> I mean, in the just as an example, in the last couple of weeks, we've had you know problem with somebody refusing to uh, not use their e-cigarette, and we had problem with somebody um, refusing to not drink alcohol. And there's yeah, it gets across the board. Okay, I'm going to take it out to the public at this time. Um, are there any questions or comments about this from the public on this part of the agenda? Okay, I'm going to bring it back to the board. You can have questions and um, comments. Devon, and then I'll come back to you. Mm -hmm. I would have to um, kind of go back to Mr. Leopold's point on the advisory committee and making sure that they are in support of the code of conduct as well, I, I, which I'm sure they would be, but just it would be really important. And then also I know that UC Santa Cruz, um, you know, tab, we have our own transportation committee, and as we make up some of the highest ridership of the buses, I would hope that students' input would be important within this process of the code of conduct since we ride so many of these buses. Um, I just like, but I don't want to delay the process. I really don't. But the code of conduct is actually really important. I think it's something that we do need. Um, I've had my times where I want to tell people to close your legs. You want to sit here, um, or I will sit on you. Um, so like, please move your legs. So like, like I've had that experience. However students and just people in general in the community have to be able to look at this first before we put it out there, which is why I would like, agree with Mr. Leopold's point that we have to go to the committees and then even have Larry and, and his committee on our campus look through that as well. Thank you. Ms. Matthews? I personally feel uh, very strongly that um, it would be appropriate to move ahead with this uh, at this point. I, I want to relate back to uh, the experience with the library system and uh, this is we've had similar problems with the library particularly the downtown library but I know other branches throughout the system and uh, the library system did develop a pretty specific code of conduct and a, an appeal process uh, sequential uh, consequences um, for problematic behaviors and an appeal process and so forth, similar to what you have laid out here. Um, it was driven by user complaints, as, as you've experienced here, and the impression, the experience has been uh, a marked improvement. Um, and I, I think when we talk about uh, the problem of declining ridership, uh, this is integrally <laughs> related to that. It's not just the frequency of the routes and so forth, but um, do you, as a senior uh, disabled person, feel comfortable riding the bus? Do you feel comfortable letting your kids ride the bus? So, to my mind, uh, having a, an expectation of safety um, is really important. And so I would feel comfortable moving ahead with this at this point, but also engaging um, the rider committee and the, the students. Um, there's still a long way to go, obviously code of conduct can be changed. A lot of thought has already gone into this. It's also important, I think, for the drivers uh, to have some expectations to fall back on and refer to. So those are, um, it affects a lot of people. One of the things that strikes me is we haven't had any kind of reporting on the incidents, um, except maybe occasionally something anecdotal. On the library joint powers board, we received as part of our monthly packet the incident reports, and there was real encouragement getting the um, frontline staff to make a note of the incidents and how they were referred. And I realize it's a little bit different, uh, perhaps, but um, if the questions have been asked, what's the frequency of this? Um, really egregious observed cases by one rider, maybe a couple times a month, but or whatever, but uh, when you take cumulatively what all, all the drivers are observing in the course of their many routes. It can be a lot and it can be kind of serious. Yes. I mean, you put yourself in the position of a rider, ugh, how are you going to feel? <laughs> so I, I think it's important to move forward, to refer this um, to the, both the students and to the uh, ridership um, committee. Um, for their input as it moves forward. This is just in the beginning stages. So um, 
with all those comments, I would be prepared to move the recommendation before us, um, which includes referral to the other committees. Okay. Um, well, so, comments are a second. So let's go. Uh, let's go. I, was, I, would, I, Donna, I, I would be ready Mike. to support uh, as a second the motion. My, my suggestion is that we adopt the uh, the policy and come back with a six, in six months for a review. Um, and that gives us time to go to Absolutely. all the various uh, uh, organizations, agencies, and then we have a, a set time where we know we're going to come back. Absolutely. That sounds good. Yeah. That was actually, a, that was my comment is that I'd rather see us get something in place, but, but again, a, a, any, as any new policy, we will improve on or take input and, or follow up and have a specific date to follow up and add any um, changes that are found to be necessary by all of the input. The so we'll bring it back in six months, does that sound yeah. in your motion? Okay. Yeah, and I yes. think that's the, 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 the students, the MAC, elderly, right. disabled, mm -hmm. you know, I think that that, that's that enough we time. Get all the, we, get, we have six months to get that input. Great. And it also allows them to see what might be needed. It, yeah. You know, sometimes until you get it in, you don't really understand what some of the challenges may be. Yes, Mike? Just make sure that the students are agree Make sure that students at Cabrillo are also uh, included in this. Yes. Yeah. And I, I just want to only have one other comment. Unfortunately, a lot of the people who have these support animals have no idea how uh, terrifying some of their support animals are. <laughs> <laughs> they think, oh, the animal's so cute. But you get on the bus and there's this dog, and <laughs> you're thinking, I think we're going to find someplace else to sit. It's only happened to me once. And I'm not afraid of dogs generally. I like dogs, get along with them great. But this person thinks this dog is appropriate. To, the dog is you know, snarling. It's just, and it was fine, I'm sure, walking on the bus. The bus driver had no reason to think there would be a problem. But as soon as it got there, anybody that got anywhere near the owner or the mm -hmm. person that the um, guardian of this dog, the, the dog starts, you know, burying its teeth and stuff. I go, what the hell's going yeah, on? Yeah, <laughs> So, but I just think we, I, I think we want to set the general tone, Dean, that it really needs to be a service yeah. animal. For a person that has, and you can typically, I mean, it's not easy to tell all the time, but I'd make the, the error on the side of denying people bringing them on unless it really looks like a service animal for a person that's blind or visually right. impaired or there's some kind of, you know, obvious uh, service support. Because a lot of times, it's really clear, I just, you know, I go everywhere with my dog, well, I have that to cut it. Well, I think we'd be clear on what the service animal is, like that it's a dog, because I have a phobia of rats, and like, I, it would, I know they're this big, but they, they're awful. <laughs> These service dogs are supposed to have their jacket on, which is an official designation oh. for service dogs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. And Thank unless you. they have that, they shouldn't be on the bus. Okay. That's a good point. I did not know that they had little jackets that they're supposed to wear. So mm -hmm. that's the stuff we should be looking into. And Okay, so we have um, a, a first and a second by Mr. Leopold. Um, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstain. This unanimously passes. Jimmy, uh, yes. one other thing. Um, would it be possible, uh, as this moves forward, to try and develop some kind of a regular just incident report mechanism? Uh, yeah. or, or an update, short of the six months? Yeah, let me, let me look into that and, and bring a recommendation yeah. back. I'm, I'm not readily coming up with a way of doing yeah, it. I understand. Let me look into it. That'd be great. Well, maybe... When we don't have a policy, it's maybe hard to report on, unless they're really agreed to. So, you know, it may be that once there's actually a policy yeah. in place, there will be exactly. a way to report. Yeah. Um, now, having said that, I, I, I uh, just remembered that we're aggressively working on KPIs this year, key performance indicators, and we may be able to factor something into that, that uh, where you can get some sort of monthly report on the various types of incidents. But let me make sure that we have the data re uh, collection um, in order to put the KPIs together. And you might talk with uh, the library director also. Okay, on to our next, Mr. Barrow Emerson, the Unified Corridor Investment Study. This is an even numbered item? Yes. <laughs> so you get to talk. <laughs> um, okay. Yes. Board members, I put a color version of this document in your packets because, as you know, it was black and white. And I have others here for the public if they'd like them. If they'd like them. Um, and I'm not going to go through it. I just thought it would be more helpful to have something that distinguished colors. Anyway. Thank you, Chair, Board Members, 
staff and guests. I'm here to provide the board with an update on Metro's participation and our role in the Unified Corridor Study being developed by RTC. First thing I want to say is really strong and clear. Metro is not at this time advocating for any particular outcome as far as modes and, and results and decisions. Rather, we strongly support the analytical process which should provide some objective data on ridership and costs, and that's both capital and operating costs, from which to make informed decisions. As everyone knows, the step one analysis is complete now, and there are now four scenarios being analyzed, each of which assumes some form of bus transit in each of the four, three corridors under discussion. I want to give you a quick overview of the bus concepts in each of the three corridors. I'll be very quick with the first two. In the SoCal Avenue Drive and Freedom Boulevard corridor, the concepts for buses are called bus rapid transit light. And the light infers not building a lane for buses on SoCal or Freedom. But as you will hear me, and I have said to many of you individually before, Bus rapid transit is not a singular product. It's a menu of features of which you pick and choose. In this case, the SoCal and Freedom ideas include things like queue jumps at signals, transit signal priority throughout a corridor, off-board payment to speed up boarding, so those types of things. So I'll leave that for the moment. Secondly, the Highway 1 corridor has two bus transit scenarios in it. One is the bus on shoulders concept, which is meant to be a relatively low cost way of getting some transit speed in a freeway. The other option being considered is the full-on high occupancy vehicle lane, which has been a topic in this county for many years. I want to move on to the rail corridor, where I think most of the misunderstanding, controversy, and community angst is. The bus rapid transit concept in this corridor. First, a quick definition of bus rapid transit. I kind of already said it. Bus rapid transit does not need to be a continuous and identical operating environment like rail. You've got to have rail from one end to the other. So, if I can reference this map here quickly in no detail. With bus rapid transit, the goal is to provide the transit priority where it's cost effective, while remembering you need to serve important origins and destinations, which may or may not be along the specific corridor in this case. This is the fifth city I've worked in and that where I've been involved in BRT and light rail planning. And in most cases, the concepts include multi for bus rapid transit have included multiple operating environments along a single corridor. In my Perth, Western Australia thing, I had six operating environments in 20 miles. You grabbed what was appropriate and available physically. Bus rapid transit also lends itself to staged implementation over the years. You may stay in a city street for a few years until the cost of effectiveness of moving into a priority facility, the money is available and the cost effectiveness makes sense. So the graphic overhead shows the ideas being considered for bus rapid transit in the rail corridor. Note there are a combination of two-way bus, one-way bus, and also buses operating on the public streets. So I think I've kind of beat that topic to death. It's horses for courses, do what fits, and what's viable and common sense. During step two, Metro will provide RTC with bus networks and associated station stop recommendations so that their consultant can then, through modeling, do patronage forecasting and come up with a cost estimate that I told you about. If I could finish and, and take the liberty of my observation from experience with these types of projects, like every other city or community, people have moved quickly to advocacy for specific modes for various reasons. This isn't or shouldn't be a debate between bikes, trains, and or buses, but rather it's an economic question about regional mobility and the decision as to what role public transit can take in any of these corridors and how it serves our greater economy as it relates to commuting, connecting people, and jobs and homes. Lastly, technology advances are starting to blur the differences between public transit modes. It's important not to align oneself with steel wheels or rubber wheels. It's starting to disappear as technology evolves. So, again, I'll finish with rather than 
align yourself with steel wheels or rubber wheels or trains we used to ride or buses we used to ride or enjoying riding bikes. This really needs to be the debate about the economic opportunities which public transit may or may not present in these corridors. That's my presentation. Happy to answer questions. I have a question before I go out to the, the board. What, um, why does it stop at, why do you stop doing it at Freedom Boulevard or C Cliff? Is that Freedom Boulevard? Um, and Aptos? Why doesn't it go all the way to Watson? Right. In terms of bus rapid transit south of there, the Metro staff's recommendation has been to operate in the freeway corridor because the rail corridor south of that point goes through areas that are not going to be extensive draws of ridership, uh, pretty expensive places to deal with, but it particularly we want to serve Watsonville on the way up and serving Watsonville is Main Street and Freedom and all those things. So it only seems viable from that state park point north to consider the rail facility corridor. So if you're in the city of Watsonville, then you just have to get to the, you just have to figure it out how to get to the train station? Well, whatever mode, you're either at the Watsonville Transit Center or as the vehicle moves up Main Street or Freedom, you're kind of doing what our buses do today or whatever mode. But in terms of providing a bus option, we want to move through the community of Watsonville in the normal bus manner. Yeah, the rail line um, it, 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 right outside Watsonville, it goes through marshes and, and fields. Right, right. So you're not going to have uh, stops. But I'm saying like within the city, I mean, is there, this seems like, is there going to be any bus getting to the, the train station itself or, you know? Oh, if, if there happened to be a train station, and, and maybe I should have said that, in the train alternatives, Metro is going to be providing for their analysis bus feeder network. Okay, that's what I wanted to do. Network. Okay. Thank you. I'm sorry I misunderstood. Thank you. Um, any other questions from the, the board? I just wanted to say uh, this is one of the most controversial issues we have in this county now. <laughs> Many of us are on the, Art, the Regional Transportation <laughs> Commission and uh, we hear it uh, one way or the other and we have uh, kind of like uh, national politics. It's either or and nothing's in the middle. So I really appreciate us taking uh, a reasonable approach of what we can do and can't do to help this situation where we have so much of the housing uh, development taking place in the South County and the jobs and so forth, uh, many of them, most of them being in the North County or over in Silicon Valley. Uh, this is a tremendous, one of the biggest issues that we have in this county and I think it's, uh, it's, it's we're responsible to be part of the solution. So uh, I appreciate your saying this is not what we're saying you should do, but I think uh, the Metro can be a, a real uh, benefit to everybody involved in making this uh, a reasonable solution, and I hope we can get there. Ms. Ms. Rockin. It seems to me that the only position that we should take, and it seems like an important one, is to not short-circuit this process. There are people out there who are taking the position that we should not even do this process. It's a waste of money. They write letters to the editor. It's a waste of money. We should just decide right now to make this into a hiking and, and a bicycle path. Yeah. And I think that is not in our interest as a transit agency. So what, what, that, what the outcome could even be, no rail, no whatever. But it seems to me it's critical that our position be, let's do the study and figure out what the actual transportation needs are before we come to a quick conclusion to do any of the options that are out there. I'm no longer on the RTC, so when is the study going to be finished? I know you're, you're on it. Uh, it's expected to be done by fall. August or this um, fall? No, it's, it's probably uh, October. September or October okay. is when it's supposed to be done. Uh, I would uh, just say uh, that uh, at the risk of uh, ruining my colleague's reputation, I agree with a lot of what uh, uh, Director McPherson said. Um, and I, I appreciate the staff participation in this. You know, we purchased this corridor for transportation. It's the last transportation corridor through Santa Cruz County. Um, and so we, uh, there, are, there are physical limits to how wide you can make the uh, highway. Um, we have to look very seriously about how to use this corridor in, in, in the best way. This unified corridor study isn't going to come out with a exact re recommendation to use it this way or that way. In the end, if there's gonna, we're going to have to make some choices based on the information. And we, as the Metro, um, and then the, then the public at large, and the RTC in specific, is going to have to look at really the transportation issues, uh, not just the recreation issues. So 
uh, I look forward to that discussion. It, it's it, it, um, it's only controversial because people just want to take sides, but if we're really looking at transportation policy, it is incredibly exciting to be able to actually, to, to, to potentially plan for a transportation corridor. That, that doesn't happen uh, often. We won't get another chance. Ms. Lynn? Yeah, the RTC voted December 7th to move forward with the study. So that's not been very long. And um, I know we've had groups come to our council, and that's been my position as well, is that I don't want to make it, I don't want to endorse or make a decision until we have all of the facts. And there's a lot of money been invested in this study, and all the taxpayers are paying for that study that was promised uh, in the campaign for Major D. So it feels like we'd be short-circuiting the process if regardless you know as a city or as a metro representative or in any position to endorse any one and i agree with the also director leopold it's an exciting time and it's it, sadly it's there's a lot of emotions come in and, and it seems like we're some of us are being attacked regardless of, you know for whatever side they think we've taken so. <laughs> norm and then cynthia and chase i was on the original committee in the rtc who made the purchases my statement then is what it is now. I am looking, thinking forward to 2040, 2050, a real, light rail system can connect us in this county to other areas reasonably and quickly. Just not within our county, but with the entire state and the entire country by rail. It's a possibility. And no, it's not going to be done tomorrow. And there's an awful lot of people who need the transportation rail system, and we can't use a bicycle. And that's a possibility that I thought of then, and it's one that I have now. Thank you, sir. Ms. Chase. Yeah, I just want to really appreciate the position that uh, Metro has taken on this, because I know that there has been strong pushes and pulls for Metro to take a very specific position, and I really think that the approach that the Barrow just outlined is really an important stance to take in this process that really supports, I think, the comments that have been made here today. It's very thoughtful, it's very open to looking at different types of transportation modes, not drawing a conclusion too early, and thinking about, I think, the same way we approached when we were looking at um, our structural deficit. We looked at connectivity and how can we maximize ridership for those who really need to move and have transportation that is reliable, efficient, addressing climate change, all of those kinds of things. So I just really want to acknowledge and appreciate the position that Metro is taking on this. I think it's a really important stance in this uh, part of the process and really, um, I think, positions us well as partners in trying to solve our transportation issues regionally. Thank you. Anybody else on the board? Comments? Questions? Alrighty, so this was just an informational piece, so that's that's that. Okay, so um, on to our next item. I think we see Barrow again. So um, to initiate a fair, oh, fair restructuring. Mr. Chair, just in the way of a quick introduction, you, you might recall that uh, since my arrival on this property, I've taken this board on quite a journey dealing with your structural deficit, dealing with... You take us for a ride. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, wouldn't quite fit. <laughs> you know, we've dealt with the uh, structural deficit. We've dealt with uh, uh, changes to our paracruise structure. We dealt with the comprehensive operational analysis, and, and you had a, a lot of tough years through 2016. And uh, going into 2017, even though I had queued up for you a discussion about fair restructuring, the, the board said, hey, could you give us a year off and just let things calm down for a little while? Uh, which we did. We took all of 2017, didn't bring anything controversial. Uh, but 2018 is here, and we feel we need to move on to the discussion about barrel restructuring. Barrel's going to tell you a little bit about why that's important. Um, we don't take it lightly, but there is reasons and rationale for uh, um, talking about barrel restructuring at this point, or at least investigating it. Um, so with that introduction, Barrel, why don't you talk a little bit more about what you did with the committee. All right. Thank you. I appreciate that it's late, and I will be relatively short, but I think I owe this a, a clear presentation to you. So let's talk about the proposal to initiate a fair restructuring analysis at this point. 
As part of long-term financial and service planning, Metro staff has been conducting preliminary analysis of fare restructuring and importantly, including technological upgrades to fare payment systems. Very important in this day and age, again, as we speak to lost ridership and issues of that type. On January 15th, on January 5th, the Metro Finance Committee received a very similar presentation and directed the uh, staff to bring this presentation on to you. The fare structure is a very important tool for operational efficiency, marketing of your service, and possibly most importantly, long-range budget planning. The fare restructuring analysis is necessary because we have potential risk to our five-year balanced budget, which we just finally achieved. One of the more important points of that is we now know that Metro, starting in year 2020, will be receiving a lesser share of the STA funds. We already know that. So the last three years are now at threat of being in deficit. Also, based on future budget projections, this is really important, and we touched on it with another topic here. Metro will need additional revenue to maintain our existing bus service levels over the next five years as funding sources remain relatively stable while costs are increasing. If I could have you look at attachment 1A, AA1, excuse me, and it shows the Metro annual operating budget, you can see it creeping up over the next five years while the fare revenue is currently projected to stay flat. You'll note that Metro is forecast to finally not use reserves to achieve a balanced budget starting in FY20. That's really important. Please also note that this balanced budget assumption does not account for any pay increases anywhere in the agency, which could occur starting in FY20. So we're already behind the eight ball. Attachment A2. This point is re the previous point is reinforced by this attachment, which notes that the operating budget, if you look at the lower right, in the last two or three columns titled uh, total fair revenue and total expenses that in the next five years the total expenses move from 48 to 53 million dollars while the fair revenue admittedly at this point is assumed to be flat that's you know that's simple math this budget forecast that we have already assumes our growth in revenue from measure d and sp1 sta revenue which as we know is potentially at risk so, on to attachment B. Another implication, and this is pretty nuanced, another implication of stagnant fare revenue relative to an increasing operating budget is a decreasing fare box recovery ratio. As attachment B shows you, starting FY18, our fare box recovery ratio is projected to decrease from 24 to 22% if we don't have a higher level of fare revenue. And this is the important part of that. One of Metro's primary revenue sources, the California Transit Development Act, which provides us almost $7 million a year, has within its statutes the ability to punish financially agencies which don't achieve a 20% fare box revenue. Low fare box revenue could start costing us our basic revenue we count on. So, another reason to undertake this analysis is it is standard in transit industry practice to look at your fare structure every five, six years. The last Metro fixed route local service fare modification was in 2012. The 20, to be honest too, the, fare, the 2012 fare change was not a comprehensive restructuring of the pricing of all the various passes. It was merely a revenue increase to deal with the impacts of the recession that we were just coming out of because that problem was exacerbated by the reduction in sales tax revenue we had. So, lastly, on attachment C, coming out of the recession, a recession, five of our Northern California transit agency peers have implemented fare restructuring increases, which have taken their base fare beyond Metro's $2 base fare. Scale of revenue opportunities. In general, currently Metro has about $10 million a year in fare revenue, and we all know from looking at attachment D that between UCSC and Cabrillo, that's about half of our fare revenue right there. So we're talking about 10 million, half of which are those two contracts. If directed, staff will return to the Finance Committee in February with, a de with detailed concepts as to how Metro could increase fare revenue. Targeted strategies. I know we're all concerned about raising prices for people. That's a reality. We're in somewhat of a social service business. However, 
targeted strategies. There are opportunities to implement targeted strategies that would address the various needs of our non-UCSC and Cabrillo riders who are generally transit dependent and have lower incomes. The types of things we could do is discount scenarios for various passes. Another opportunity is to incentivize non-cash payments by providing discounts for using our smart cards, our cruise cash, or our cruise pass. So fair payment technology, I'm going to touch on this just slightly, but we'll get a lot more detail of this later. It's very complex, nuanced, and it's all cutting edge technology at the moment, so it's changing. Basic fare restructuring, such as just raising the base fare and adjusting the discount of a monthly pass, could be achieved without any change in technology. A fare restructuring does provide an opportunity to consider other aspects of fare collection, such as improving customer convenience, trying to reduce the inefficiencies in Metro's current fare collection process, such as the long dwell times from cash payments, a dollar at a time, watered up out of the pocket, service delays due to onboard cash payments. New fare collection technology could be implemented concurrently with the fare restructuring if required, or at a later date, and we'll be explaining our choices over the next few months. This determination can be made based on whether a particular technology is required to implement the desired fare structure that we want, and what are the cost considerations and time frames of those technologies. More sophisticated fare restructurings would require fare technology upgrades. So, I'll finish with process. It's requested that the board direct staff to initiate this fair restructuring analysis so that we can give adequate time for public consideration prior to a proposed final restructuring decision in May and the adoption of the annual budget in June. That's specifically why we'd like to resolve this in May. So the sequence that could follow is we had the introduction today. February through March, staff does analysis and has a first round of informal community engagement on the fair restructure concept. And my proposed approach to this is the same as the COA. We want to go through an informal cycle with people before we bring recommendations to you, and then those recommendations can go through the 45-day public hearing process. So again, end of March, we come to you, the board, with a preliminary proposal based on February and March's public input. Then from March to May, the second round, the formal public comment period on the draft proposal, and hopefully a public hearing and adoption of some form of revised fair policy in May. Once we get to that point, in general, it usually takes at least six months to implement a fair change. That could be impacted by our choice of fair technology ideas that we want to include. That's my presentation. Happy to answer questions. Wow, as outgoing chair, I'm excited that this is not going to be on my my table. <laughs> um, so, <laughs> just being honest. <laughs> yeah. We'll get the vote on it, don't worry. Right. <laughs> um, okay, so any questions from the board? Comments. Comments? Okay, no questions? Um, is this something, what, are we voting on this? Or? Yeah. So, okay, then we, let's go to the public first then. Any questions from the public? Okay. <laughs> you know, um, uh, just one consideration. Uh, I mean, even though we haven't raised our fares, um, going to a 225, 2.5, I think, uh, hinder us because um, uh, uh, then you know, begin to put the time allowance. Because not everyone, you know, um, can use the smart card. Not everyone has been able to, you know, keep in touch with all the um, gadgets that we even provide today. Um, so it's it, it's critical that uh, during this process we take into consideration do we raise the fare or because the quantifying I'll sh show you an example Highway 17 we charge seven bucks and Monday Friday you have you know um, students going uh, going to San Jose State and and workers they got their card they uh, they got their eco pass they got they got their they got their stuff Saturday Sunday day trip got long lines and everybody's paying seven bucks it takes us you know five to ten minutes to load so the load factor is, is you have to also take into consideration um, and because you know it, it's just hard in this community especially with the populations uh, uh, population that with the, the we carry um, to move, uh, to move at 
2.5, you know, how long is that going to take, you know, pennies and getting away from even pennies is a conversation. That's hard for this community um, because that's sometimes <coughs> so thank you. Thank you. Anybody else from the public? Okay, any comments? If I okay. just make a quick comment there, those issues are really important. Mm -hmm. We are currently, I don't want to unveil things, but we've got some new technology things in place to address change, credit return, one-way fare passes on Highway 17. So we've been work we know that one. So thanks, Eduardo. Thank you to both of you guys for being on that. Um, Mr. Larkin, I mean, <laughs> Mike, okay. I, I take the uh, Highway 17 bus roughly once a week uh, up to uh, Deuteron Station on the Caltrain and then on BART. And on, both on Caltrain and BART, there's no lines boarding because they take care of it, you know, or they have a uh, proof of fare thing for Caltrain where you buy your ticket and every so often they walk down the aisle and buy you up to $200 and kick you off the train if you haven't got a ticket. And for the uh, BART, you have to like, uh, can't get into the station except for you buy your ticket ahead of time. So one of the things, we, and my experience with the Highway 17 bus, first of all, I'm impressed that our machine take as many of the dollars as they do. It's much better than your experience of going to the car wash or I don't know, wherever you tried it, because it takes most of the dollars. But every so often, there's a dollar that won't go there. And you're sitting there waiting to go, I'm trying to catch a train, and the bus is very close. It's a five minute connection for me, or four minutes. And I see somebody there struggling with a the dollar. The bus driver says, turn it over, they turn it over, nothing happens. They don't just pay the dollars, they pay the quarters and stuff. And so they, they drop it on the floor. They, where'd the quarter roll? Then there's people that don't have the seven dollars to, you know, they, they got ten. Anybody have change for a ten dollar bill and there's a fight going on in the line while you're waiting? And this is during the week when Eduardo was just described it as relatively smooth. Most people do have a pass or they put a phone there, whatever the heck they do. And but you watch this go on and it takes five, six minutes to load it. And I'm sitting there literally, I'm gonna miss my train if this guy can't get his dollars in there. So one of the kinds of technologies that even low-income people can deal with, it's like BART structure, at least for the Highway 17 Express, it won't work on all of our routes, but you have a machine that's somewhere outside the bus and you can't get on the bus with money. You have to put your $7, take your time before the bus gets there, put your money in the machine and get out a ticket, and all you have to do is put the ticket in the thing. And so there's that kind of technology, there's a bunch of other options. And I would say if you start to take into account how much driving time we lose by people loading on the bus, we might find it sufficient to put a bunch of those kinds of machines, not just at the major transit centers, but in 15 places in the county, because, you know, at, at bus stops, because you can make those things secure. There's lots of change machines and stuff all around the community and on Pacific Avenue and other places. So we, we really should be looking at these. Uh, we, we, we will have to raise our fare. I've lobbied enough in Washington and Sacramento to know that we got a lot of grants in the past because we showed that our riders are stepping up and paying a higher percentage of the cost than in some other communities. So we can't afford to let this thing slip to 20% or even you know, 21% or something. That'll cost us when it comes to going lobbying for money. Um, I mean, nothing to do with the actual fare itself. So I'm excited about this study and looking at these you know, trade-off options. Raise the fare, but give people ways to pay. But don't make them stand in a line and allow them to get somewhat of a di bigger discount if they buy the ticket rather than trying to get on the money with, you probably still have to accept the cash option. Maybe not. I mean, that's another possibility. Or Highway 17, I bet we can get away with not having anybody try and pay as they get on the bus. Get on the bus like you can get on the bar to get your ticket before you get there. Director Chase? Yeah, I mean, my comments are similar to Mike's, but, um, and I appreciate that we did ask for this to be postponed, and it was postponed, and, and I think it is time for the analysis. And I want to emphasize especially that this has been brought back to us with the combination of looking at technology improvements, which I think are incredibly important, not just for the folks who will be impacted by any potential raise, but also in bringing new ridership into mm -hmm. the system. And so we've talked about that with ABL, Eco Passes, looking at how can we make the ease and efficiency for those who are currently riding um, better so that even though it might be impactful for them to have a, a, an increase, the efficiency or the ease or knowing you're going to be able to board and get to your uh, stop on time might make it a little bit easier to, you know, to, to deal with. But then also really thinking about what are we doing as a system to attract more ridership, um, things like ABL, I think, are um, big components of that so that people know when the bus is coming, they know exactly when it's going to get there, they know when they're going to arrive. Things like that, I think, we have to do in conjunction with this. 
um, so that we're really taking care of our current writers and looking at attracting more. Thank you. Dr. Matthews. I agree with all the previous comments. The recommendation, as shown here, is that we direct staff to initiate the fair restructuring analysis. But part of the summary includes the importance of the technology technology part of it as well. So um, I'd be prepared to move the recommended action, adding the phrase, including opportunities for improved fair payment technology. So it's very clear that that's what we're looking at. I agree. That's on also, uh, on less than I'll second it. OK, Norm, second it. Um, I, I, I agree. I think that the, looking at the technology is really important. And when you go to other cities, that's how you do it. So. And it will save time. And Mike, your story. <laughs> Monterey has a system. Your Monterey has a system where they actually give you change for your, your payments. See, so I've got a bag yesterday. It was I have a, chart, a receipt for three dollars and fifty cents. So, and they do this automatically with their machines. That's Before the idea you I was telling off. you earlier that we're stealing from Monterey. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> same, uh, we have the same fare boxes, so we're on the path for that. Okay, I, I'm glad you guys are really looking at all options, so thank you. So, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Oppose? Abstain? This unanimously passes. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, 24. So, this is from Alex. Recommendation to approve revisions to the bylaws of the Santa Cruz County Metropolitan Transit District's Board of Directors. I'm going to kick us off, actually. Um, Great. Truly. So, this is basically um, mostly a cleanup item. You have your existing board bylaws. They haven't been updated in a while. There were changes to um, just clean up job titles. You went to a single monthly meeting, so we had to clean that up from your previous <coughs> two meetings a month. And then I scoured your enabling legislation to make sure your bylaws reflected the law, which they do now. Um, they, they were close, but they weren't always exactly correct. They are now. Um, and then uh, Alex has put in some, um, some new uh, language that has to do with travel uh, policy and reimbursement process, which Alex is going to highlight. Sure, and that uh, new policy is found on 24.8.10 and 24.8.11. Uh, basically, it doesn't change the way that you've traveled in the past if you want to continue to provide us receipts and have us reimburse you. But it adds one other option uh, that is commonly used today, which is the GSA, uh, using the GSA website for per diem. Um, we're, we're doing that now at a staff level, so we're also offering that as a change for board members. Thank you. Questions? Well, I would just say it is hard to evaluate what has changed because what you told us now is more than we got in the written, uh, um, uh, in our packet, and we didn't. There was no strike through version. It was so it was very hard to tell what was the the changes here. Um, and in the future, we we you got to have that because. It, it, um, Something that you may consider inconsequential may be consequential for somebody else, uh, and it's it's we're it's better for us to be able to show what we've changed. Did you memorize the old one? It's it, I I've had a tattoo, but it's on my back, so I can't <laughs> see. It. So to include a red line version with yes. Um, yes. that that's actually a really good oh, idea. Yes. To include red line versions with the final product. Thank you, Mr. Leopold. Any other questions? Uh, public, does the public have anything that they want to say on this? Move approval to recommend changes to the bylaws. Okay. Second. First is second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Oppose? Abstain? This unanimously passes. Thank you. Okay, uh, number 25, we're back to Alex. Okay, 25 is a request to do a board work session. Uh, Director Hagen uh, asked me towards the end of last year if we could do something again similar to what we did a couple of years ago. And uh, that, I thought that was quite timely because also I'm looking at for uh, this year wanting to have a board work session as a kickoff for, a, uh, for our first um, Metro Strategic Business Plan. Um, so I think that would be a great place to create a foundation for that. And I'm proposing a, a similar structure that we have a facilitated structure that the board uh, be able to identify, I, I hope, a full day for this facilitated 
uh, work session. And then coming out of that, we would take it back into staff's hands, start working aggressively on the strategic plan, uh, likely have several check-in points with you along that journey. Maybe even later in the year, another uh, uh, maybe a half-day work session to try to bring it all together. And then possibly by the end of this year or early the following year, have your first uh, strategic business plan in place for this organization. So that would be the recommendation that you uh, allow me or allow Gina to start trying to work with your calendars to find a day sometime here in early 2018 to have a work session. Great, thanks. Um, my suggestion for the last time is that we do somewhere in Mid County um, because back in the hills of Scotts Valley was a it little was far. out there. It was out there. It was out there. <laughs> <laughs> Beautiful. <laughs> the price was right. The price was right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah so Capitola sounds good. Um, and then, uh, is this going to include management, or is this just going to be? Um, because I know some people include their manager, their yeah. directors. We would like to have management. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it'll be directors and the council. Yeah. Well. Any other questions about this? Who will be authorizing? Okay. Um, I think I have to go out to the. Um, the public on this? Any comments on this? Okay, any comments in general? Okay, uh, there's a first and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstain? This unanimously passes. Did Cynthia Matthews say second? Yes. And then, okay, so Alex again. Okay, uh, this, this one involves uh, making you aware that I've communicated with CARB, the California Air Resources Board, on their latest uh, draft of their uh, that they published in February, you have that in your packet under uh, um, attachment A. This is their innovative clean transit regulation discussion document, published December fifteenth. You recall we did not have a December meeting, and uh, CARB set a deadline, an aggressive deadline for comments on this. They extended that, but the extension was through the twenty second. So I had to file the letter in order to meet that extension. I'm asking the board to um, to receive, uh, offer any kind of comments, or to tell me that uh, you completely disagree with the letter that I have in the packet and that I should retract it, which whatever your preference is. But absent that, um, I will be going down to a CARB meeting in Orange County on Monday to testify about the same kinds of things that you see in this letter to CARB. Um, all of this comes out of uh, really what has been happening since early 2000 when CARB said, hey, it's time to start getting transit properties on board with clean vehicles. You might recall back in the era of around 2000, the big talk back in those days was particulate matter. And so in a particulate matter uh, environmental discussion, uh, it would, you know, getting out of diesels was important and CARB endorsed getting into compressed natural gas, for example, um, because compressed natural gas is low, very low particulate matter. But even then, CARB had a vision of trying to get transit properties to start moving in the direction of electric vehicles. And they had hoped by the time their uh, regulation that they adopted in about 1998 would expire, that being 2015, that the electric uh, industry would be uh, aggressively developed and they could then come back and impose a 100% electric mandate. Well, 2015 to 2017, through 2017, CARB worked with transit agencies, worked with us at the CTA to try to come up with a zero emissions um, regulation. And there was a lot of back and forth, a lot of disagreement about where they were going. We worked through the CTA. We finally got to a place in 2017 where it appeared that CARB was going to work with each individual property on an MOU. They would do a memorandum of understanding and, and not do a blanket policy, but treat each agency different based on uh, what was going on in that environment that that agency was working in. Um, unfortunately, uh, mid to late 2017, CARB completely reversed all of the work and the agreements that had been put in place and said, nope, we're going to do a regulation. Shortly thereafter, December 15th, they promulgated this regulation. Um, now, the position that, that I've taken in this letter is not one against zero emissions buses at all. It's not one that says we don't need a regulation. It's one that says, you know, we agree with you, but there are things here that we have to work through. We need to be a little bit more flexible. That mandating that by 2029, 100% of our purchases be uh, zero emissions, um, that may be okay. But remember, you adopted a goal, not a mandate. 
Um, that's what you're, that's really consistent with what you want to do. By 2029-ish, you want it, you want us by 100% zero emissions. By 2040, you'd like our fleet to be 100% zero emissions. But you also recognize that there are things here like technology that have to continue to evolve, and maybe most importantly, money. Um, you know, if the money doesn't flow, it'll be difficult to do this. And when you're faced with 62 buses that we need to replace, and money does money is found, if that money is flexible money, we tend to want to buy compressed natural gas buses because we can get more of them than we can uh, electric buses. Electric buses <coughs> almost double the cost of compressed natural gas buses. Um, so. Uh, with that, there are other issues like uh, in the technology, the battery technology. So buses, uh, electric buses now, they pretty much maxed out all the nooks and the crannies that you can put a battery into, right? And so those buses can only achieve a certain range. And those ranges may not fit nicely with the ranges that we need or other properties, quite frankly. For example, we operate 17 routes that have over 200 miles a day on those buses, right? Well, one manufacturer claims, Proterra, claims to have a bus that'll go up to 300, and that's actually the one we're looking at for the uh, LC Top uh, grant that we have. But that was in perfect conditions on a nice flat test track. Um, you know, all the conditions were perfect for them to achieve the mileage that they got. So we don't know how it'll perform in our environment, let alone environments across uh, California. Um, and, and so we need, and, and the other issue with this is that uh, battery density uh, technology is evolving. That is how much energy you can pack into a battery. That's really where the changes have to take place. It's not going to be over the next several years and figuring out how to add more batteries into more nooks and crannies because they don't exist. It's going to be in that technology of how much energy you can pack into the same space and that will give us the range that we seek uh, in the future. Uh, why is that important to us? It's important to us because what we don't want to do is have dedicated fleets. Um, dedica dedicated fleets, in this example, mean that maybe you buy so many buses that only have a range of this amount, and therefore they can only run on certain runs. So in our very tight and cramped bus yard out there, we have to figure out how to park certain buses over in a certain area because they have to only run on certain routes. That's a very complicated thing for us to do every morning on a pullout. If we had built a yard that had, say, a herringbone structure where every parking space was unique and we could always park the same <coughs> bus in the same space every day, it would be a different story. But that's not the yard we built, and, our, and we shoehorn our buses into our yard today. So this, that's just a few examples. You no doubt read the letter. Um, I think we need to work with CARP to get to a good place where regulation acknowledges some of these things gives us some outs in order to be able to postpone the implementation without being penalized. And that's the recommendation I have before you. Okay, thank you. Questions? Mr. Leopold, the Ms. Matthews. Well, uh, um, I don't disagree with uh, what's in this letter, and uh, you, you made very good points. And I also understand what CARB's trying to do, and it, it follows a California strategy, which is you set these aggressive limits um, and you make requirements because you need the industry to move faster. They've done that with electric uh, cars. You know, the requirement that manufacturers of, uh, if you, I don't know exactly how it works, if you, if you manufacture a certain number of cars for sale in California, you have to have an electric vehicle. And that, if they have supported the purchase of those electric vehicles through resources. So um, uh, the one point that I would uh, think that to, to also hammer home is the, the given the increased cost, the almost double what it, uh, what it costs for an electric bus, um, and that the fact that the technology um, hopefully will be there in 11 years, that there also needs to be, um, CARB has to, has to either provide or ensure provision of resources to help this transition take place. Because that's what we've done with the electric cars with the, the electric charger networks, with the, with there's, and, and I think that the point that you make um, about um, energy provision, about uh, working with PG&E or others to ensure that you have a rate that, that doesn't break the bank as well. Um, you know, I plug in my electric car and it starts charging at 11 p.m. 
and it's you know usually fill up by by uh, by uh, seven. Those are the that's that's pretty cheap. It only costs me about twenty five or thirty dollars a month to 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 energize my car. Um, but if you have to charge during the day, it, it it could be three or four times as much. Yes. So it becomes incredibly important. Um, and uh, and also uh, there may be some part of that about uh, a rapid uh, charging stations um, because if they can't get the, the the distance, there has to be an easy way that someone could come charge charge a bus, you know, in a in a quick you know uh, uh, you know fifteen twenty minutes, bring it back up to full. Um, uh, to, to get it done. I, I won't pretend like I know what, the, what that is, but uh, to try to figure out both the charging uh, pieces, the economic resources to be able to support the change um, seem to be very important. Oh, that is Ms. Beth. Thank you. Um, this was a fascinating item, which I knew absolutely nothing. Your mic's not on. It should be on. Oh, there you go. Yeah, okay. Um, knew pretty much nothing about this area before reading the letter. It seemed very reality-based to me, which is a good thing. A um, couple of questions. Um, is the California Air Re Resources Board a freestanding final entity, like Coastal Commission, what they say is what happens, or is there, a, uh, what's the hierarchy? No, that, that's my understanding. If they adopt the regulation, it will be. That is it, yeah. okay. And second question is, your approach uh, reflected in this letter one generally shared by the industry, that concern? Yes. Um, um, for example, CTA just in the last week communicated their letter to very similar themes. Uh, that's representative of transit properties across the state. And then other transit properties are sending individual letters to. Would it help to have additional comments from other entities besides transit? Thinking like our, I mean, cities, other, counties. Yeah, other entities that have an interest in viable transit systems. Yeah, I, I think uh, similar to a grant application, it couldn't hurt. Just mm -hmm. sh shows more support for your position. Um, I, I want to be careful to not misrepresent what we may or may not be able to accomplish. Um, CTA, and, and I think they're pretty well plugged in, have been clear that their reading of the tea leaves is there will be a regulation this year, uh, that the governor has sent down a, a, you know, pretty much a mandate and CARB is following that. Um, so what we're looking for is, is trying to get them through the process that starts Monday, trying to get them to adjust, to make adjustments where we can get adjustments. Right. But it I appears there will that. be a I regulation. I understand that, but yeah. having it somewhere in the universe of feasibility Mr. Okay. Um, I have no, I think the letter's great. Uh, I think it's fine that you said it. Um, I, and once again, John made three points that I was going to make, and I won't even talk about them. Yeah, I agree with him. Um, I'm a student of mine, so I picked up a lot. Of <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure it went the other way. But the, um, I think two other points. We have this experience now in terms of where the technology is of, of uh, trying to purchase a bus that may or may not, which either may not. Um, go fast enough for us over the hill, or that it might um, require more charging than we thought it would, or something. And that's an example of where the uh, industry is now, the electric vehicle industry is now. Unfortunately, what worked for cars, where there's billions of dollars at stake in producing for the market, we live in a country where transit's not the way most people get around. And the reality is the promise of great riches from making this bus work or something may not interest uh, the industry at the same level that the car industry responded. So whereas I think you do have to lead the regulation that sort of encourage, you know, they're not asking us to do this by tomorrow, they're saying, you know, not in, uh, you know, uh, in a, a future point, but it's still, you know, we're talking 11 years away or something. But the reality is um, we may not be in a position to have the actual vehicles we need to make things work the way we want them to work. I mean, even if we I don't know whether those incentives will be as, as successful as they've been with the automobile um, industry. So I do think it's critical that we make people understand where we're at in terms of the likelihood of being able to implement this. 
because there would be a huge irony if we're to forced to retire buses from the road and people go back to single occupancy car driving because we can't produce the, the best. And so you have this sort of, we can't get the perfect and you end up, you, you, you don't even get better if you end up in the worst situation. And I think that needs to be communicated. I think any more questions or comments? Another one? Well, I would just add, you know, I think what they're trying to do is California is the largest state, obviously, in the, in the country. We have the most buses, and they're, and they're trying to, to, to use that market in order to drive the industry uh, nationwide. And uh, it does still come, and the other thing I just wanted to also add, CARB can adopt regulations, and uh, they're kind of the final say. The legislature, though, can pass bills to influence the uh, uh, CARB decision. So if they... If they've come up with That's something, if right. they come up with something, the legislature could write a bill and say, no. not practical. And I, and I believe that uh, part of the cap and trade negotiation <coughs> this year, there was some, there there was some accompanying legislation to to, to change some of the card <coughs> regulations. We don't want. We, we'd rather them get it right the first time. But uh, that is a, a, a way to make it do something. Thank you. Anyone else? Yeah, I'd just like to. Oh. And uh, yeah, this um, and the addition of acronyms goes on and on and on. It seems like yeah. all of this, but um, I think two things: flexibility and reality are the two things that we're really trying to get at in following what we all want to have happen uh, for the public credit ridership. So I, I appreciate the comments that were made by others. Okay. Thank you. Just a couple of closing points. Uh, at the last uh, executive committee a couple of weeks ago, CTA, we did talk about the legislative approach. Uh, and they may they may uh, try to find a sort of a bill to introduce to try to keep something running in parallel. But at the end of the day, what we felt is that uh, the governor wants this. CARB is doing this because the governor wants it. And even if a bill were to pass, you've got to get the governor to sign it. And that might be the problem uh, with that. But we still think still think that trying to run something in parallel to hold their feet to the fire might, might yeah. Be. My well, thoughts. it's an 11-year requirement, mm -hmm. and the governors are only around for one. So. <laughs> that's, that's, that's a good point right there. Uh, just real quick final note. I, I want to acknowledge that um, our team has come a long ways with electric. They, you know, remember, we, we knew nothing about electric you know, as recently as just a couple of years ago. And uh, our, our team really, which is sort of Ciro and Eddie and Aaron and Barrow, um, and, and a lot of their support staff, like, like Tom Hiltner, have come a long ways to learn about this and get up to speed. Uh, and this letter isn't just you know, me putting a bunch of stuff in writing. It's, it's that team putting this down uh, as a result of what we've learned in this very short period of time. Thank you. Okay, so do we need direction on this? Move that we accept and file this new letter. Okay, second. So. First and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstain? This unanimously passes. Okie doke. Our next thing on the item, the time has come for me to pass the gavel to the next. No, no, no. Nope. One more. Jesus. <laughs> the entire day, it's, I, I am doing odd, odds and evens. Like... <laughs> Alex, you're finish. on again. All right, this is. I've been uh, trying to get through this meeting. It's been a long way. Be but we gave you December off. Remember that. Um, so the 20, 27 is uh, your annual. Uh, that's the last time you use that. <laughs> that is true. Uh, that, that's your annual calendar year. Now calendar year 18, state and federal legislative program. As you read that or read that, you notice that the themes are pretty much the similar as prior years. Uh, protecting revenue, looking for new revenues, uh, protecting against unfunded particularly costly mandates. Uh, you see in the report that on the state level we had a really good year. Yeah, SB1 passed, so that was good. AB113 Bloom passed, which was really good to protect the uh, STA money from being distributed uh, further uh, and decreasing the amount of dollars that come to us. On the federal side, I have to admit, I struggled working with Chris in order to put a couple of bullets down that we did, simply because we have the administration that we have and we haven't had really much attention paid. Um, to transit through this administration, at least through the calendar year 2017. Um, on that note, we do have this sort of um, secret document about uh, Trump's infrastructure program that got revealed nationwide in the last week. Give some hint about what he's thinking. Um, he seems to be modifying some of his approaches, not so much in the 3P, you know, public-private partnership arena. 
But what is distressing is when it comes to the transit side of the business, I think, Mike, maybe you talked earlier about us being able to go in historically for funding, and maybe the feds would fund 80%. Today, that's kind of migrated into 50%, for example, our 5339, in order to try to be competitive. We did 100% match, right? 50% us, 50% them. Um, he's proposing that the federal government participate at the 20% level. So it just gets worse. Um, so our trip, I think our trip uh, to, to D.C. is going to be important this year, Mr. Chair. And I hope uh, that uh, you'll talk about that today, too, and identify the members that would uh, go to, to uh, Washington in April or May. Um, if you wouldn't mind jotting these dates down, just working with Chris in the last couple of weeks, uh, we think that something in the range of April 9th, the week of April 9th, or the week of April 16th, or the week of May 7th, or the week of May 14th would be good weeks um, to go to D.C. Um, we'll probably, we'll, we'll definitely want to meet with the FTA again. Um, we may need to have a discussion with the FTA about our $3 million uh, LONO grant and the poor performance of the BYD buses and try to figure out an alternate strategy so that we can make sure that we keep that money here and still have it go to electric buses. Um, the final note that I would make is if you look at page 27-4, um, you often hear about self-help. Um, I think that pie chart really talks a lot about self-help. As a matter of fact, if you look at the operating cost, which is what that pie chart represents, 71.5% of the cost of operating this agency, in effect, are self-help. It, it is our old and our new sales tax initiative. It is the passenger fares, and it, it is the advertising and leases. Um, we are truly an example of a county that has a lot of self-help. That's on the operating side. It's a struggle on the capital side, as you know, and that's, that's where we run into the rub with the, the, with the federal government that's looking for you know, self-help more so on the capital side these days. Uh, Mr. Chair, that's my introduction to the item. I'm happy to entertain any questions. Okay. I guess um, while we're here, I, you know, maybe should I check to see who would be interested in going this year with us to D.C.? But I know that there's... So we have uh, one, two, three. How many go? I, um, we, we, we took four last time, so yeah. it, it's, you know... Who so, raise your hands, Mike? My, Chase, I mean... Awesome. The dates will, will make yeah. a difference. Yeah, the dates will probably make yeah. a difference for a lot of us. So, yeah, so yeah. the same <laughs> last year's four plus Cynthia and Ed, and then um, we'll work on the dates because I think that'll that'll affect a lot of us. Okay. Well, just uh, 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 linking the previous item with this item, um, there's uh, the federal government could play a role in promoting a low emission, zero emission vehicles. And we, have, uh, we did have an administration that used to do that. Um, and uh, I, I, I would encourage everybody to look at uh, the New York Times today, Paul Krugman's column, which is called The Economics of Dirty Old Men. And it has nothing to do with porn stars, but uh, it, <laughs> it's just this administration's um, uh, subservience to the fossil fuel companies um, at the expense of everything else. I mean, they, they, they proposed that the rest of the electricity grid subsidized nuclear power because because it didn't, didn't work. Um, but uh, uh, just the other day when um, Trump put uh, tariffs on solar panels, um, it's going to be like the loss of jobs and stopping uh, an industry that's, that is actually taking off, right? There are more jobs in, in uh, renewable energy now than there is in fossil fuel. and. Um, it's it's not it, it's not it doesn't make realistic sense in terms of policy. It's it's really uh, 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 adhering to the donors' wishes, and it's not in the interest of the country. And so that to expect that the federal government, at least in the next three years, two years, whatever that is, is going to help us out with our electric bus, uh, it's probably not realistic. Thank you. All right, so. Uh, can I get a question? I have a question? Oh, question? Okay. Um, I noticed in this state legislative agenda, the first bullet is uh, protecting SB1. And I noticed, um, we all know there is a statewide organization now. I think it's Protect Transportation Funding. I got the name more or less right. I recently got some information for them with a two part. Agenda one is to oppose the repeal of SB1, and the other is to support the passage of uh, a ballot measure on the June ballot to um, 
strengthen the use of transportation funds for transportation. So I didn't see, maybe that's implied, but um, I would hope by this action that we could officially join that um, statewide uh, campaign. Absolutely. It's consistent. Yeah. Thank you. So with that, I'd Good idea. go ahead and move the uh, recommend, okay. recommended action. First by Cynthia, second by Mike. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? This passes unanimously. Thank you. Okay. Now. now. <laughs> the time has come for me to say goodbye. I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> I, so anyways, this is the time that we're going to be um, taking nominations for our next, well, a lot of positions. So from board chair all the way down to vice chair to our committees, um, to the RTC, to the SCCIC, to the SCCRTC. There's, <laughs> there's a lot of positions that need to be filled. So I don't know if anyone came prepared um, with a filled out sheet already, or sheets. Or, I mean, the reality is that you can or, just open up the nominating uh, yes. and then come with your slates next, next month time. when we actually do the election. I mean, if that's more okay. time efficient for you. Yeah, so we can just open it up and then come back prepared next week, next month. So you move to open it. I, I move we open it. Okay. okay. Exactly. Okay. So my only comment is, would it be helpful if people told you of the positions they might be interested in just to sort of start what they're not today necessarily, but before we get to the next meeting. Yeah, I don't mind doing it. If someone wants to come to me, and I can, I could put a slate together, and that could be one slate I can might, enter. I mean, again, there may be there are often there are alternate slates, and that's fine. Right. But I just think maybe just it helps this mm -hmm. process if everybody's not just yeah. silent until we get to the next meeting, and you have to make up what you think would be good or something as an application okay. slate. So I would make that suggestion. It's not going to do it. Just a suggestion. If you want to be in one of these positions, committees, etc., right. let Jimmy know. So. Got something to start with. Right, that'd be good because there's a lot, as you guys can see, that need to be filled. So, um, if you guys want to come to me, I can start filling in the positions. Um, maybe some of you don't want to be on some of the committees anymore, and you want to switch committees. It's all up to you guys. Just let me know. Mm -hmm. So, should we just take this sheet, put our name on it, and circle the ones? We <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, that would be yeah. And then if you just want to circle it, and then yeah. um, let Give me know. You. Yeah, it's both sides. It's two sided. Don't forget. Yeah. So there's positions on both sides and then um, and then I can put together the entire uh, the entire election all right so that's been first and seconded do I um, all in favor Aye. Aye. oppose abstain clearly passes it is it is it will be open it is now open okay um, number 29 so this is Alex Consideration of appointment of Kevin Andrews and reappointment of Veronica Elsea to the Metro Advisory Committee. Elsie. 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 Sorry, I was putting the Latino. <laughs> Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. Abstain? You want to remember to ask the public in case there's anything. That oh, think. public, is there anybody that um, would like to comment on these two people? Great. Um, did I just take a vote already? Abstain? Nope. This unanimously passes. All right, number 30, consideration of revising. Wait, I, I'm sorry, I didn't catch the first and the second on that. Rock and, and Chase. Thank you. Okay, Consider, consideration of revising the Santa Cruz Civic Improvement Corporation, SECIC bylaws to change the annual meeting date and appoint one director to serve as the SECIC board member. Mr. Clifford. Yeah, so briefly, I, I think the one board member choice can be handled through the process you just laid out for the uh, uh, previous nomination committees and whatnot. Other than that, this is a recommendation for a minor revision to the bylaws for the SCCIC. Right now, today, you come back in February, you, you vote on that new member, um, and then you instantly move into a meeting for about three seconds, and then you close it and, and you complete your business for a year. Uh, this just recommends that you, you push that annual meeting out to March and, and just unclutter it. Okay, great. Thank you. Board? Move for the for okay. simplicity. <laughs> a first and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstain? And this passes. Alex again. Okay, you already covered uh, Congressman Panetta, so just one item. Uh, the APTA Universities Conference 
uh, is going to happen here in the region. Um, it is going to, they, they searched high and low, looked at uh, hotels all across the county that could accommodate the room nights and the space they needed, and they ended up signing a deal with the Scotts Valley Hilton. <coughs> so that conference will be here. Uh, my staff is working real uh, hard on that with APTA. The conference will be 623, June 23 through June 26. I hope you will put that on your calendar and save, save some time because you may want to come and participate in that and we may want to ask you to uh, participate in different parts or be a speaker. Is that the conference I went to last year? No. Okay. Uh, you went to the board members conference. Oh, is that, when is that one? Uh, I want to say it's around the same time frame. Because I remember it was summer-ish. Yeah. Yeah. I've I, I gone to these in the past and they're really interesting. They're, they're properties that share a lot of our similar issues and problems and we learn a lot when we go to these. And, I think this was important for the, the base for us getting that special um, stick money, the special transit, uh, uh, special transit, <laughs> small transit intensive cities. There. Yeah, we went from uh, hit to stick. Stick, yeah, whatever. It was like crazy. Anyway, I, I really recommend you look at this seriously because it's a, an actually <coughs> interesting conference where you learn some stuff that's useful for our district. And we should point out that Larry Fagler has been really involved in this with us too, Great. representing the university. Thank you, Larry. Anybody else? Yes. Yes, Fabius. <laughs> um, I also sit on the board of Visit Santa Cruz, which is a local visitor promotion entity. Oh. And if you're not in touch with them, um, I suggest you get in touch because they can give you lots of material to make it a great visit to Santa Cruz County. Okay. What is it called again? Visit Santa Cruz. I'll give you the info. Okay. That was great. Any other comments, questions? All righty. Thank you for that report. Uh, we did this within three hours. Thank you, guys. It was a really thick um, board packet. So, um, Alex, would you like to give us a? Do you have a question? No. Oh, Alex, would you like to um, give us a review of the items to be discussed in closed session? Um, well, this is the first time I think I've ever introduced a closed session. Um, this will be a closed session for public employee <laughs> performance evaluation pursuant to government code. 54957 D1. Uh, do I need to say anything more? Is that good enough? Okay. Public comment. Public comment, and you anticipate returning back. Okay. So we will. Oh. Right. Return back, but nothing to report out. Clearly, it's new to Alex. Um, any comments from the board? I mean, from the public? Okay. Um, with that, we are going to. Our next meeting is in the beautiful city of Watsonville. And we will see you there at 9 a.m. on February 23rd. Thank you. <laughs> That's how you push through a meeting. There you go. That's good. That was a... It was supposed to be four hours. Yeah, right around.